We're good. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jolene Noel, and I'm the clerk to the SDAB. And in the absence of an elected chair and vice chair, I hereby call this meeting of the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board to order at 2.01 p.m. As per Section 9.2 of the Town, Camor, Town of Camor Bylaw 2019-06 Subdivision and Development Appeal Board, and this being the first meeting of the calendar year, a chair and vice chair are to be elected. Therefore, the first item on our agenda this afternoon is for the board to elect a chair and vice chair for the term. Uh, I will look to the panel and ask for a nomination of a chairperson. Uh, Jolene, I would nominate Graham Locke as chair. Okay, thank you. And I'll actually ask three times. So I'll ask two more times if anyone else would like a nomination for the chair position. And I'll ask a third time if there's any nominations for chair position. Okay, so it looks like Graham Locke has been nominated for chair. I move to the board, sorry, I move the board to accept this nomination. Show of hands of all those in favor. All right, looks like uh, there'll be none of those opposed. So this motion is carried unanimously. And I'll also look to the panel now for a nomination of a vice chair. And again, I'll ask three times. Um, has anyone like to nominate someone for a vice chair? I nominate Greg Birch as vice chair. Okay, thanks, Michelle. I will ask a second time if there's any nominations for a vice chair and a third time if there's any other nominations for a vice chair. All right, uh, Greg Birch has been nominated for vice chair. I move the board to accept this nomination. Show of hands those in favor, please. All right, those opposed, motion carried unanimously. Uh, I thank you and I will now turn the, the floor over to Graham Locke as the chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jolene. Um, I call this meeting of the Subdivision Appeal Board and Development Appeal Board to order. My name is Graham Locke and I'm a public member of the SDAB and I'll chair, be the chair for this hearing. And I would ask that uh, all questions be directed and comments be directed through me as the chair. Uh, I'd ask the board members now to introduce themselves. Uh, Greg, perhaps you could go first. Hi, I'm Greg Birch. I'm a public member of the SDAB. Michelle? Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Cruz. I'm a public member of the SDAB. Thank you very much. The, the clerk for this hearing is Ms. Jolene Noel, uh, who is with us. And uh, we need a motion, I think, to uh, adopt the agenda. So are there any additions, deletions, or changes to the agenda as provided? Seeing none, I move that the the board to adopt the agenda as circulated or as amended. And those in favor, please, to a raise of hands. And none opposed, it was carried unanimously. Um, before introducing the appeal by the development officer, I'd now like to have each member of the town administration present uh, to introduce themselves. Could, could we have the administration, please? Good afternoon. My name is Lauren Miller. I'm the manager of planning and development with the town of Canmore. Thank you. Are there any other? I'll go next. Yeah. Thanks, Graham. I'm Marcus Henry. I'm the supervisor of the planning and department here at the town of Canmore. Thanks, Marcus. <clears throat> Hi there. I'm Clara. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Claire. Claire Ellick, transportation engineer with the town of Canmore. Thank you. And I'm Brian Kinsey, project engineer at the town of Canmore. Thank you. Uh, Jane Dean, meeting administrator, also permit clerk for the town of Canmore. Thank you, Ms. Dean. Are there any others representing the town administration? Katie Bravo Stewart, the planning administrative assistant and SDB clerk in training for the town of Canmore. Thank you, Ms. Bravo Stewart. Are there any other members of the administration present? Hearing none, I would now ask the development officer to introduce the appeal file number before us today. I believe that's Ms. Miller. Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, did you just want the file number or would you like me to start with our presentation? I, I think, uh, I think just the file number for this this moment, and then we'll okay. 
get to the material later? Not a problem. The file number is PL2021-0215. Okay, now in terms of identifying the parties, so I wonder if we could have the appellant or their agent identify themselves to the board. I believe that's Mr. Schultz, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is uh, uh, Chairman Locke uh, and my video has been stopped, so. Okay. There we go. I'm, I, I identify myself as the appellant, uh, Chairman Locke, uh, Gordon Schultz, 713 Mallard Alley, Canmore. Thank you very much, Mr. Schultz. Do, Mr. Schultz, do you have any objection to any of the board members hearing this appeal? Chairman Locke, no, I do not. Okay. Have you, Mr. Schultz, received a copy of the agenda package distributed to the board? And do you have any objections to any of the information provided? Uh, Chairman Locke, yes, I've received the package and no, I have no objections. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Schultz. Uh, then I'll just outline the hearing process that we'll go through this afternoon. First, we'll, the administration will make a, make a presentation, their presentation, and then we'll ask Mr. Schultz in his, as appellant to make their presentation in favor of the appeal, followed by others speaking in favor of the appeal and providing any correspondence in favor of the appeal. Then those speaking in opposition to the appeal, if any, and any correspondence in opposition to the appeal. Um, lastly, those speaking neither in favor nor in opposition uh, and any related correspondence will be given an opportunity. At, at any time, the board may ask for clarification by any of the persons speaking to the appeal uh, and the board may then ask for a short recess if necessary to consider uh, that, that advice and information. To close, the administration will be asked if they wish to provide any clarification or closing remarks, followed by any clarification or closing remarks from the appellant. The board will then close the public portion of the hearing and go in camera and review all of the information provided. And then the board will provide a, a written decision within 15 days following this hearing. The purpose of the hearing is for the appellate and affected parties to provide the board with information to the appeal. And the board must base its decision on planning merits. As outlined a moment ago, affected persons will be given an opportunity to speak. Uh, please ensure that all comments are directed to me as chair. Also, we would ask that all comments be of proper decorum and succinct. If another person has already made that point, simply state that you agree with that point and continue. If any person presenting is referring to a written document, including a map, photographs, or a report, a copy of those documents, if they haven't already been left with the clerk, must be left with the clerk. Does, do you, Mr. Schultz, does appellate have any concerns with the process as outlined? None. Thank you very much. I would then now ask that Ms. Miller as the development officer to make the presentation with, re with respect to this appeal as, as put forward by the administration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great. So good afternoon, members of the SDAB, those in attendance virtually and those tuning in via our live stream. Before I start, I would like to note that the file manager who has been handling this proposal uh, is currently away. Uh, in an effort to not postpone this matter further, I am stepping in on their behalf. Accordingly, please note that I may not be able to address uh, detailed discussions that may have occurred between the file manager and the applicant. Um, that may have occurred over the progression of this particular file. But between myself and other members of town, and town staff present here today, uh, we will be able to present the key elements of the proposal, the public concerns that have been raised and provide the town's response and rationale to those concerns. 
This application was forwarded to the Canmore Planning Commission for a decision as new developments and significant renovations in the town center district have the potential to garner community interest due to its location in the downtown. With regard to the statutory requirements associated with this appeal, the decision of the CPC was made on July 28, 2021. Uh, the notice of decision was posted on August 1st. Notice of appeal was received on August 18th, which is within the 21 day period from the date of the written decision as required by the MGA. Uh, notice of the hearing in writing was provided to both the appellant and the applicant at least five days prior to the hearing as required by the MGA. Uh, notification was provided to adjacent neighbors in writing at least five days prior to the hearing as required by the MGA. Advertising of this hearing was done on September 2nd and 9th in the Rocky Mountain Outlook, which is, was at least five days prior to the meeting as required by the MGA. And public notice of the hearing was provided on the town's website at least 24 hours prior to the meeting as required by the SDAB bylaw. Accordingly, the statutory requirements for this appeal have been met. As I'm getting into my presentation, I would ask that any questions uh, associated with this application are held to the end, uh, where myself and my colleagues can answer them comprehensively. So the subject property faces 10th Street with Main Street to the south and Mallard Alley and one block of residential homes to the north. This is a view of the existing building. Uh, it's outlined in red and the current use is a legally non-conforming detached dwelling. This application proposes 10 units of visitor accommodation in two buildings connected by an external stairway in the middle of the site. The front building facing 10th Street includes two units on the main floor with four more on the second and third floors. The second building has seven parking stalls on the main floor, as well as waste and recycling storage in the parking area. There are four units above on the second and third floor. The rear yard includes three surface parking stalls. This is the applicant's rendering looking northwest from 10th Street. Uh, the edge of the existing mixed use development can be seen on the left side of the slide. The application largely conforms with the land use bylaw regulations, including the building form, materials, and detailing as outlined in the Community Architectural and Urban Design Standards found in section 11 of the land use bylaw. Now this application does require four variances. The first is to building height. The roof peak is at 11.61 meters above the main floor, which is slightly raised because of high groundwater in this particular area. As you can see on the slide, the area of overheight roof is fairly small. Uh, importantly, from a building massing perspective, the seven meter eave line shown in blue uh, is complied with. This slide shows the roof height and area requiring variance from the side elevation. So again, a fairly small portion of the roof. From the rear elevation, the portion of the building over height is shown in blue. Again, on the, you can see the mixed use building again um, on the right uh, is slightly taller. Uh, please note that this approval of the building, the mixed use building that's kind of identified on the right um, is not precedent setting, but it's noted on this slide simply to provide context and scale of the variance being requested with regard to height. Uh, the height variance that is proposed is small in area and is partially a result of the steeply pitched roofs which are encouraged in the land use bylaw. And this is the sort of scenario that regulation 4.1.5.7, as noted on the slide, is attended to address. The next variance that is required is the front yard setback. So the front yard setback requires the building to be a combination of one to two meters from the front property line. Uh, the building proposed does this, but there are decks proposed at the front of the building that project into the required setback. The third variance that is required is reg with regard to the loading stalls. So section 2.7.3.1 of the land use bylaw does require new non-residential developments to provide a loading stall, but also allows for some discretion on this matter given the site context of the proposed development. 
While administration does feel that loading can reasonably take place without a dedicated stall on site, it was counted as a variance in the application presented to the Canberra Planning Commission. Um, it's worth noting that many existing businesses in the downtown area do not have a dedicated on-site loading stall. And the scale of development proposed is not expected to require a large or frequent amount of deliveries, considering there's no restaurant or other amenities on site. The fourth variance that's required for this proposal is with regard to the building entrance. The land use bylaw is explicit uh, it requires visitor accommodation development to take a prominent, to have a prominent point of entrance. The facade as proposed has not provided this. Uh, the applicant has been directed to try and incorporate something at the pedestrian access on the west side of the, of the building. The requirement, this requirement has been made a condition of approval that they incorporate elements that address this to the satisfaction of town administration. As the full intent of the bylaw is not expected to be achieved, it is still proposed as a variance at this time. Administration does not see this as being a major issue. With regard to the notice of appeal, there were three main concerns raised by the appellants. The first one is the impact on a budding residential district. The second being parking requirements and third, the lack of on-site management or oversight to respond to any potential issues such as noise, parking, or garbage. With regard to the first item, the impact on abutting residential, uh, while 4.1.5.9 in the, the LUB um, is to minimize the impact on adjacent residential, this has largely been complied with by the proposal by limiting direct access, a direct parking stall access from the lane, um, using similar architectural treatments as adjacent buildings, and all mechanical equipment is enclosed and not visible from the exterior. Uh, with regard to the concerns raised by neighbors about noise and hours of operation, the land use bylaw does not contain any limitations or operational requirements for visitor accommodation development within the TC district. So it's difficult to impose such requirements as part of the development process for a permitted use. If it had been the intent to limit visitor accommodation adjacent to residential areas within this district, uh, this could have been explicitly noted or listed as a discretionary use rather than a permitted use which would have given, given the development authority greater latitude to impose mitigating measures. The next concern was with regard to parking. Now, the land use bylaw establishes the minimum as well as maximum number of parking stalls as, as one parking stall per accommodation unit. Now, because the, uh, the proposal does provide this, the application complies with the required parking and any deviation from this, so either to require more or less parking would be a variance. Uh, the appellants have concern about the adequacy of the visitor accommodation parking, but with this being a permitted use, there is minimal latitude for the development authority to require more. Lastly, the lack of on-site management. Uh, concern has been raised about the lack of on-site management to control noise, parking, or potential garbage mishaps. There are no requirements in the land use bylaw for on-site man management via a front desk, physically on-site. Uh, so there is no ability to require this of the applicant. As well, concerns about garbage, noise, or illegally parked vehicles are all matters that can be reported to and followed up by the town's bylaw services department. And our engineering department has also noted that if there are concerns about parking within uh, the alley or surrounding streets, that residents have the opportunity to raise those concerns with the engineering department and as an assessment of mitigative measures uh, conducted. So there are, are, are other opportunities uh, for these concerns to be addressed outside of explicit conditions of approval. There were two letters received from impacted individuals and were included in the agenda package for the board's review. Uh, and with that said, uh, we are available for any questions. 
Thank you, Ms. Miller. Um, Mr. Birch, any questions? Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple. Um, looking at the conditions of approval, there are four actually that uh, in the end that say that this has to be provided uh, before the uh, permit is issued, I, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Is that unusual from the town? Uh, it seemed to me that there's a lot missing from the application and uh, a lot is on faith, uh, including some of the, so, uh, yeah, including some of the things that would be required, hence making it difficult to make a decision. I just would like to hear your response to that. Sure. Uh, so there are some conditions. It, this is not uncommon to have conditions uh, that are dealt with later on in the development process. Uh, so at the time that these applications are brought forward uh, to planning commission or even to uh, the administration as the develop acting as the development authority, uh, there are some very detailed elements that would be premature for uh, the administration to ask for at the time of application. Uh, so we do um, acknowledge that and allow for the applicant to uh, work through some of those details with town administration uh, post-approval. Okay, next, next question is uh, with regards to the entrance way and the setback. Um, so sensibly there'd be uh, a one meter setback and I'm assuming from the drawings that the, what I'll call the decks, if you will, um, mm -hmm. Uh, they go right to the property line. And then the vegetation showing on the illustration is actually in the private, or sorry, the public right of way, the, the street, so to speak. And there's an agreement being proposed for the vegetation to stay. Um, some of the policy set uh, in the land use bylaw says that the street should be wide. So when this vegetation is placed and it's approved as such, and you enter into this maintenance agreement, in the future, when the town or if the town ever wanted to widen the sidewalk, uh, what would happen? I, I would kindly direct that question to either Mr. Kinsey or Ms. Ellick to respond. Sure, I can, I can take that question. Um, yeah, certainly when we reviewed the application, we did note the presence of, um, of shrubs in, in the municipal right-of-way. Uh, we noted that this is the predominant pattern on the block. And considering that the town has no immediate capital plans for, for widening the sidewalk, uh, we considered this and, and agreed that this would be a uh, welcome addition to the current streetscape as it is. Uh, the maintenance agreement we struck in such a way that um, the landowner will be responsible for maintenance of the vegetation, but it will not restrict the town from any future modifications. So should the town wish to use the municipal right-of-way to widen the sidewalk, we'll have the right to do so. Okay, thank you. Just, just on this deck and the, and the setback uh, requirement and the relaxation. So can you just elaborate, uh, Ms. Miller, on the requirement uh, for the one meter setback and how these decks, which go up several stories, uh, protruding into the front yard, um, would would relate to that setback requirement of one meter. It, it's one to two, I understand, but it, the minimum seems to be one meter. Yes. So uh, I just need maybe for you to clarify your question. Uh, your question is to how the decks relate to or so sorry I'll, I'll just elaborate so so the setback is one to two meters the idea is that it would be uh, um, alternate in and out a little bit to give some variance uh, decks may or may not be seen as the front face of the building but these ones are all essentially consistent with the with the property line, there's no setback, including the steps down. Uh, so I'm just, I'd like to, so, so the town gave a relaxation in this regard is fine with that. It seems odd if the idea is to have wide streets and uh, 
and, and a, a, a variation in the front to have uh, essentially steps right down to the property line with no setback. Uh, I'd just like to understand why the town might have felt that that was okay given the policy. So I will say that there, through you, Mr. Chair, that there was some ongoing discussions with the applicant uh, with regard to these decks and their positioning. Um, and the administration was willing to accept uh, what was being proposed as it does provide articulation to the building facade. So um, it was a bit of a part of the negotiation. Uh, it was noted as a variance and therefore if uh, CPC or even the board today feels that that is uh, not an acceptable um, approach, then um, changes can be proposed. But we were willing to accept it because it was it still um, articulated and accentuated the building. Okay, I, I'll, I'll move on, but I, I'll say that it's hard for me to understand the front yard setback relaxation when we don't actually know what the front of the building is going to look like because that comes later. And then you have a requirement for a significant relaxation, but I'm not making a decision. I'm just, I'm just making that as a point. Miller, respond. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that our, our conversations uh, with the applicants, as you noted, will speak to the, um, the front um, and as well as to the, the materials used uh, for that entrance. So, um, I do understand the point that you're making um, and the applicant is aware of the concerns uh, that we have expressed and we're hopeful that they'll be able to address them um, as they move into uh, further processes. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I just have probably two more questions. With regards to the rear access and this parking off of the laneway, um, and I've read the land use bylaw requirement, I assume that the town's interpretation is that the four stalls not in not covered by the building are direct access from the lane and that the fact that the rest come off what would be a, a driveway into the parking under the building that that's that's allowed that's that's the the driveway or laneway sorry not laneway but the driveway I guess access that, that is correct for you Mr. Chair yeah thank you thank you okay and uh I had one more, but Mr. Chairman, I think I've forgotten it right now. I'll, I'll, I'll go on to uh, somebody else. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Birch. Ms. Coos, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my first question relates to um, Mr. Birch's question on the front yard setback. And I was wondering, uh, Ms. Miller, if you can comment on what the purpose of these one to two meter setbacks are and why they're a requirement under the LUB. Thank you. Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, these reduced setbacks, particularly in uh, the town center, um, are really to encourage an activation of the streetscape and allow for those pedestrians to have an interaction uh, with the buildings that they are walking past. Uh, so that is, we're, we're really trying to encourage um, pedestrian level entrances uh, so that uh, you have a connection with the things that are around you. And um, it's not cl quite clear to me from the drawings. Uh, thank you, Ms. Miller. Not quite clear to me um, what percentage um, it doesn't, uh, of the building is within the two meters and within the one meter. Um, it looks like all of the building is uh, one meter from the frontage. Is that correct? Or is some of it in, in fact more than one meter back from the frontage? Uh, can you just, just give me one moment? Sorry, I'm just writing through I'm my notes here. Okay. Okay. 
so the can you repeat the question? Sorry, I've got a little bit turned around with looking yeah. at my notes. I'm wondering how much of the building is between one and two meters uh, setback, if any, and then how much of it is within zero to one meters? Because I'm trying to get a sense of um, of what percentage is, is within the one and two meter allowances and what percentage is actually um, less than the minimum requirements. So the, it would, from the drawings that we have, it would appear that the, the entire front of the building is within that one, that the building, the two units on either side are built right up to the one meter setback. Okay. So nothing between the one and two, and then the portions of the building that are within the zero to one meter are the decks and the stairs. What percentage of that of the frontage would that co constitute yeah, approximate is fine. What percentage of the frontage or the facade? Uh, Just the facade, I guess, the, the building proposed. Um, looking at the note here and it looks like- I can help you out here, Lauren, if you need- um... Sure, I was gonna say, it looks like 65%, but Marcus, yeah. if you can see it, please jump in. I sure can. Um, if you guys are, are inside of, of, of like the package here for today's meeting. If you flip to page 14, you can see there on the site plan, um, DP 1.1 is, is the drawing. And if you look at the front elevation or the site plan there, you can see that there is a, um, a label showing 40% of the building um, is actually set back to, it would look like two meters. And then the remaining 60% is right at one meter from the from the property line and that 40 percent is the area and with the decks and the entrances so the deck and the entrance goes doesn't go to the property line but goes to one meter from the property line correct if you're okay if i just share screens here real quick i can uh i can show you exactly what we're looking at yep that'd be fine thank you yep so Um, can you see my screen there? Yeah, so we're looking just at this section right here. So as you can see, you've got the front decks and porches all around here. This section here is set back um, to two meters, as you can see right here on the side. And you've got the remainder of the front facade where the decks are, are not shown and that projects out one meter from the property line. And overall, you can see here, there is a calculation given that's showing it at 40%. And then the deck itself is right on the property line. Uh, it's pretty close. I wouldn't say it's right on the property line, but it is very, very close to the property line. Thank you for that. Yeah. I have no other questions, uh, Chairman Locke, at this point. Thank you, Ms. Coos. Just, just one follow-up from my perspective on this last bit of a discussion, Ms. Miller, and that's the, uh, you, you implied that there may, may be some, if there are some adjustments, there are, have been discussions with the, with the uh, owner that, uh, that might deal with those alterations that we may make. If in fact, the one meter, if the, the deck going right out to the property line was to be disallowed by SDAB, what, what would he do? What, what are the options? Through you, Mr. Chair, I can't speculate on how they would choose to redesign okay. uh, the development. They would simply be required to meet the conditions of the approval. So how they would choose to do that would be up to them. Yep, that, that, that helps. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Hi, it's Greg, and I have the, the, the remaining question. I, I recalled what it was. It's, it has to do with the loading stall. And so there's there's... I understand that the parking requirements are met. Uh, looking at the floor plans, there is no laundry in this building. So I assume that at some point during each day, uh, cleaning staff comes in and they're going to presumably clean the, the rooms in transition. And then they're going to take out the laundry and deliver it uh, to some laundromat somewhere and, and whatnot and bring in fresh stuff. In short, it would be really convenient if I was a, a cleaning staff member to have a place to park my vehicle really close. And I'm just wondering if there was any uh, acknowledgement of that 
ongoing daily need to for for parking and what might be the solution and i i noticed that the applicant is is likely to speak uh, certainly present here and I'll, I'll be asking the same question uh of that but from the town's perspective what would be the proposed solution for day-to-day -day cleaning staff and, and hauling in and hauling out the laundry from 10 units? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you noted, Mr. Birch, uh, this, this question may be more apt for the, ap the applicant as they can speak to the, how they plan to operate uh, this particular facility. Uh, but it is worth noting that um, Typically, when the cleaners are coming in, that those who were occupying those rooms have left. So that may leave some opportunities for uh, the staff to park on site in those situations. Uh, but that truly is a management decision about uh, how and where their staff will park uh, and when they come to work as, as they may encourage them to bike, walk or take the bus and parking may not be an issue. Uh, but if it is, that is an internal management issue that they would need to address. Thank you. The, the, just for the record, they're prob probably not walking with the laundry, but or taking the bus. But but I, I get your point. I was, I'll, I'll, I was well, your yeah, question I'll, was about staff, so I was just thinking if staff coming to work, they yeah. could walk, bike, or take the bus. But no, no one's walking around with towels downtown. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Uh, there being. No other questions, Ms. Coos, you're fine. Um, we would then now ask the app appellate, uh, Mr. Schultz, to make his presentation with respect to the appeal. Mr. Schultz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just waiting for my video to come up. While I'm doing so, um, a question has just come into my head, sir, if I may ask of you. Uh, I've noted that the Subdivision and Development Appeal Board has seven members uh, listed on the town website. We currently have three in attendance. Have we met quorum with yes, three we, attending? Yes, we have, Mr. Schultz. Three is Thank four. you, sir. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the board members for their public service. At times, I'm sure it can be beyond onerous, but I, I and my neighborhood, and I'm sure other members of that community appreciate your public service, and thank you for that. I'd like to begin by just go launching into a bit of a, a history on the Mallard Alley and its relationship to the, the north side of 10th Street or the seven and the 700 block, which is uh, pertinent to this development. Uh, I've been a resident here in Mallard Alley now for some uh, 40 years. We, we purchased our home here in Mallard Alley in 1980. And at the time, uh, the 700 block, the north side of 10th Street was uh, zoned as uh, R4. And in through a uh, revision of the land use bylaw in the 1980s, uh, the north side of 10th Street was redesignated as commercial. And at the time, it was actually CB bracket SDA special design area. Uh, that was to sit back and uh, put the 10th Street in compliance with traditional um, land use practices of having uh, similar land uses facing a streetscape and then having a step down occur on a laneway or an alley. And that's what's led us to the point where we have uh, the north side of 10th Street here, a commercial or town center as it's now referred to, and a dramatic step down from commercial to R2, uh, which Mallard Alleys has, Mallard Alleys, Mallard Alley always um, has been. The, um, the point of the reason why I wanted to bring that up is because we've been living with uh, commercial neighbors now for uh, more than 30 years and have been living so with absolutely no impact on the use, enjoyment, and, or value of our properties. And I want to make a point that if the proponent had brought forward a development similar to those, similar in nature to those that we have currently uh, across from us, Mallard Alley residents would likely have had no objections. It's the magnitude of this visitor accommodation that we are having so many problems with. Now, I presented a written submission to the board, which I see has been included in your package, and I trust that it's been reviewed by the, the members in attendance, but I just would like to take a moment to, 
to touch on a, a few of the, the items that I raised. Um, the big one is the parking. Yes, this development meets the land use bylaw of having 10 parking stalls for 10 units. But there are 27 bedrooms being proposed for this development. And no one in their reasonable expectation would see that um, visitors coming into Canmore with uh, occupying some 27 bedrooms, likely offers to 50 plus individuals are going to be arriving in 10 cars. That is just totally and completely unrealistic. The, uh, with the staff, the staff reports that their, our objection is with the land use bylaw and because the applicant has complied with the prescriptive requirements of the land, of the land use bylaw. The fact that the land use bylaw does not adequately address visitor accommodation parking was apparent in another uh, application that was reviewed by the plant camera planning commission in PL 2020 0276 at 506 Bow Valley Trail. And I wanna just provide for the record some comments that were made by planning, uh, particularly uh, Ms. Miller, the town's manager of planning and development, that currently um, when it comes to visitor accommodation or other multi-unit developments, there's been concern about there not being enough parking and part of the flex we're in right now is trying to change people's behavior and get them to place where they're using active modes of transportation. There's going to be a bit of an uncomfortable period where the new developments have less parking, but it's ultimately to encourage that mode shift to active modes of transportation. That's all well and good for residents of Canmore. That's all well and good for visitors who are here, encourage them to use alternate modes of transportation, bicycles, roam, et cetera, but they're not arriving in Canmore to visit on bicycles. They're coming in cars. In this particular development, is going to provide at any given time a magnitude, a multiple of cars more than, than 10. The property has been um, uh, used as a vacation home property, uh, sold through Airbnb now for a couple of years. On the uh, September long weekend, this is a three bedroom unit and there were three cars there. Two weeks prior to that, it was rented out again and there were four cars in attendance. We're looking we are going to be facing here in Mallard Alley, the likelihood that this particular development at any given time could have 25 to 40 cars trying to get access to 10 spots. It's just not, it's just something that we find is untenable and will have significant bearing on our, uh, on our neighborhood. Secondly, I just wanted to raise the issue of noise and business of operations. Um, as again, Ms. Miller has said, it's not possible for um, the, through the land use bylaw to, to limit when people arrive to par occupy a proposed de uh, development. If it had been uh, the intent of the land use bylaw to do so, then possibly what the, the visitor accommodation use could have been made discretionary, discretionary instead of uh, permitted. We're pointing out that this continu uh, continues to be another onerous a shortfall of what the land use bylaw does in its management of visitor accommodation. The land use bylaw through section 4.1.5.9 clearly states developments abutting residential districts shall be designed to minimize the impacts of parking, loading, garbage, storage, sun shadow, noise and business hours of operation on the residential environment. The issues that we've raised and you'll be hearing more of from uh, those residents who will follow me clearly stated that this is not this development has not addressed minimizing those impacts. And additionally, even in Ms. Miller's presentation today, as she spoke to some of these elements, her comment was that the residents, the residents of Mallard Alley will have recourse through bylaw, will have recourse through engineering or management or a landlord to address issues that we are convinced will rise as this development goes forward. How are we going to get bylaw to address issues that we've got at 10 o'clock at night or four o'clock in the morning? In engineering, when we've got, I have uh, cars parked in my driveway because they can't find parking on the site or on 10th Street, and who, who am I gonna turn to? It's, um, 
A lot of what has to be said within the land use bylaw, particularly 4.1.5.9, is subjective. And what we're asking is that someone subjectively lean towards the concerns we have as residents on Mallet Alley instead of subjectively leaning towards the proponent. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt. When there's uh, Mr. Birch uh, addressed the issue of vegetation and said, well, the commentary coming back from Ms. Miller was, well, the, the, sorry, from Marcus Henry was, well, the landlord will deal with it. There's not going to be a landlord on this project. There's 10 condominiums being sold and that, that uh, current offering to real estate was included in your package, but there's 10 condominium units being sold. We'll have 10 separate owners. There's, no, there's not gonna be any cohesive management where we're going to have recourse to address the issues that we're, we're convinced will ultimately come up. I'd like to sit back and, and point out that it's important that we refer to the section of the MGA, the Municipal Government Act, as it relates to subdivision and development appeal boards. And, and I'm not wanting to sit back and tell you how to do your jobs. That, that's not what I'm, and I beg your forgiveness if, if that's what I imply, and it's not the case. Section 687.1.3 says that the subdivision and development appeal board must have regard to, but not as bound by the subdivision and development regulations. That implies that although a development abides by the town of Canmore land use bylaw, that does not guarantee it has to be approved. And I, re I really do think that that's worthwhile taking under account because everything that the planning department has said is this, it, it, it meets the land use bylaw. It meets the land use bylaw in intent, but does it really meet it in, its, in spirit? Now, the other thing that I wanted to bring up to is section 687.1.3.D.I.A. Point point and B, and I, I apologize for that. That may make an order decision uh, or conform the issue of a development permit, even though the proposed development does not comply with the land use bylaw. In its opinion, the proposed development would not unduly interfere with the amenities of a neighborhood or materially affect the use, enjoyment, and value. So it's saying to the SDAB, you can approve something even though it does not comply with the, uh, does not comply with land use bylaw. From that, we can infer you also have the capability to turn down a proposal, even if it does meet with the land use bylaw. This is something, the, these are elements that are very subjective. And it's in, again, that subjectivity that we realize we require the subdevelopment and subdivision and development appeal board to lean towards the residents and our concerns here on Mallard Alley. Lastly, I want to point out, and this is this is now very apparent, but was what's coming on, and I'm holding up a to the recent edition of the the Rocky Mountain Notebook. Visitor accommodation development in Canmore is now such a major concern that council has recommended the incoming council address it immediately upon their taking office, as outlined in the article of the recent Rocky Mountain Outlook. It is obvious that the issue is topical, contentious, and without direction. Now is the time to put any applications for visitor accommodation on hold until such time as the issue is addressed and resolved. We need someone to say Mallard Alley neighborhood will be severely impacted by this development and notwithstanding the fact it fits the detail of the land use bylaw, it does not in any way fit the spirit of the land use bylaw in minimizing impact on adjacent residential neighborhood, that being Mallard Alley. And that is you, <laughs> the Canmore Subdivision and Development Appeal Board. And with that, we respectfully request development permit PL 2021-0215 be refused and our appeal be allowed. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Schultz. Mr. Birch, any questions of Mr. Schultz? It's on mute. You're muted. Yes, I'm on mute. I, I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Ms. Coos. 
No questions at this time. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Schultz. That's, uh, that's all from the, from the board at this time. I would now like to ask those others speaking in favor of the appeal to identify themselves, to come forward and give their names. And again, I would caution that we, we if Mr. Schultz has made the points you propose to, to, uh, uh, to put forward, please, please identify that and, uh, and, and move on because we do have the points made and recorded. So if you're just in agreement, please just state you're in agreement rather than restating the whole argument. Uh, hi, it's uh, Andrew Osborne. I'm a resident beside Gord, 7-Eleven, Mallard Alley. Well, I and I agree with... What was the name again, please? Pardon me? What Andrew was Osborne. Andrew Osborne. Oh, thank you, Mr. Osborne. Yep. Yeah, I just like to state that I'm in agreement with uh, Gord and we sat down as a community and his his views reflect our overall sort of community um, view of the of the project and certainly aren't anti-development. We understand it's going to be developed, but do feel there'll be a pretty material impact on our on our street and um, our family. We have a couple of young kids and seen a lot of increase in traffic flow as a result of things like Main Street being closed. And I feel like this will compound that uh, for our life anyway. So we'll leave it there. But thank you, Gordon. Thank you, everyone, for considering our appeal. Thank you, Mr. Osborne. Mr. Birch, anything there? No questions. Ms. Booms? Hi. Um... Andrew, Mr. Osborne, uh, just wondering if you could elaborate on how you think um, this development will negatively impact uh, your your views and enjoyment of your property as a local um, resident of Mallard Alley. Yeah, you bet. So, I mean, as Gord alluded to, Mallard is a pretty unique um, circumstance in Canmore. You know, it's it's not a formal street. It doesn't have sidewalks. It's narrow. Um, so when when you introduce a twenty seven unit accommodation without any oversight or supervision that's going to be directed towards long-term or sorry, short-term um, vacationers by and large. I mean, the provisions of acquiring a, a unit in there are such that you can't live there long-term. So it doesn't really bring in long-term community residents. It's so sole, sole and, and desired uses for kind of weekenders or vacationers. Um, so, I mean, with, with that amount of volume coming onto Mallard Alley, I mean, there are things you know, negative attributes that come along with that, right? I mean, people go on to have a good time, making noise, increased traffic. Um, as I alluded to, we've seen a lot more traffic as a result of Main being closed. People just coming down the alley. Again, we don't have a sidewalk for, you know, kids to sort of have a buffer between our home and the street. So um, we certainly feel like that that amount of, of potential volume of uh, kind of, you know, activity from, from tourists is, in some way, shape, or form, probably going to impact you know, us, us negatively um, for the reasons stated. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coombs. Thank, thank you, Mr. Osborne. That's, that's all the questions from the board. Um, are there others speaking in favor of the appeal? Uh, yes, Robin Gardner. Yes, Mr. Gardner. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I'm a resident at 719 Mallard Alley. Um, I concur entirely with everything that Gord has said. Um, one question for the committee uh, through yourself would be, in this kind of scenario where there is an appeal pending, would it be normal for these uh, properties to be marketed at this stage? It struck me as cart before the horse. Um, that, um, you know, there's a number of variances outstanding with we don't know how they're going to be resolved and those properties are being openly marketed. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Um, Mr. Birch, do you have any comments on that? Um, by, by profession, I'm a professional planner, I guess. And uh, so I've worked in the planning and development industry for a long time. Uh, I've seen that several times. I, I always think it's a, an error because someone's uh, selling things before they have the approval, but it's not uncommon. Uh, I'm not sure it's right, but I've seen it before. 
um, I would assume in those instances, the buyer beware and uh, is taking the risk. It, that's exactly it. Like you don't know what you're buying. You don't know what you're getting. It's, it's, it's unfortunate, but I have seen it several times. Yeah, I, I don't think any of that is clear in the marketing information, but I just wanted to make the additional point. Thank, thank you. Ms. Coombs, anything, any, anything further there? Nothing further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Um, are there others speaking in favor of the appeal? Uh, yeah, this is Janice Barber here. Uh, I'm a resident at 709 Mallard Alley and I'm in full agreement with uh, what Mr. Schultz has presented. Thank you, Ms. Barber. Uh, do you have any any comments in addition to those made by Mr. Schultz or Mr. Osborne? Mr. Uh, no, I think Mr. Schultz and uh, Mr. Os Osborne uh, presented their uh, arguments pretty succinctly. Um, and I just, I guess the only comment I would have is that um, Mr. Osborne made a comment about us living on an alley without any uh, sidewalks. And that is very true. And um, we've seen um, a lot of traffic kind of racing through the alley because Main Street's closed. And so if you've got this increased traffic with these other 27 units, um, it's just going to be worse. And uh, there are children on the road. Uh, there are children on the, that live on the alley. And um, I, I think it's a major safety concern. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Mr. Birch, any questions of Ms. Barber? No, Mr. Chairman, I do not. Ms. Coos, any questions for Ms. Barber? Ms. Barber, I was wondering if you could comment um, and elaborate a little more specifically on the negative or positive impact on you personally that this development may, may have. Um, sure. Uh, at 709, we are almost directly across from this development. Um, and so we feel that the, the 10 parking stalls for the potential, uh, well, for the 27 uh, rooms, um, is wholly inadequate. The street parking is already extremely limited. Um, many of us who have any visitors to our homes, uh, have, those folks have to park on the street uh, because there is no alley parking. And so um, any street parking that, you know, is kind of a golden spot right now is going to become impossible to find. Um, and, you know, there's, we have neighbors that have young children. We have a young daughter. Um, and, you know, they play in front of the house and, you know, cars coming through, it's just, it's just a safety concern um, for, for anyone really that lives on the street. And the, um, the patios that they have, sorry, not the patios, the decks that they have projected to be on the uh, back of the building as well, we feel is going to be um, a noise issue as well, um, given that they can be out there at all sort of hours of the night and uh, us residents have bedrooms that kind of face those decks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Yes. Chairman, if, if I may, of, of Ms. Barber, uh, just can you elaborate a little bit more about the parking that is available on the street? Like, like how limited is it? You, you noticed, you noted it was limited right now. Sure. Um, it's, um, yeah. sorry to interrupt you. Um, there's, there's only three stalls that I'm aware of on kind of our end of the street that are available for, um, parking that is more than two hours. Um, other than that, you have to go down to the other end of Mallard alley. Um, and there's a few stalls, there's a few parking stalls along that street, but much of it is, uh, two hour parking. So, so it's very limited. So are you saying that Mallard lane 10, 10 a street or whatever it is is it mostly a two-hour besides the limits of of availability it's also a two-hour parking zone uh yes okay. thank you thank you miss barber that, that's very helpful information um sorry Graham. sorry to interrupt can i just wanted to make a note to ask everyone to stay muted unless they're speaking uh we keep having to mute people and we're getting some kickback on the on the audio Yes, yes. Reason, thank you. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Barber. Could, are there others speaking in favor of the appeal? Uh, Doug Prohl. Thanks, Doug. Mr. Prohl, please go ahead. Uh, Chairman Locke and uh, other board members, 
Thank you very much. I'm Doug Prohl. With me is Sylviane Lippert. And uh, we own and reside at 727 Mallard Alley. Uh, first, did the board members and the appeal board and the planning department receive our, and read our submission of September the 10th? It was included in the staff report that came went out to the board. I only asked the question because there should have been uh, at least three uh, submissions made. And when we started the meeting, there was a reference to only two. So there was Gord Schultz, Doug Prohl, and Janet Amy had submitted documents. Yes, and the appellant had also submitted um, a a submission, a written submission, but we count that because he's the appellant. So oh, it doesn't okay. be All counted right. as an additional. Yeah. Thanks right. for asking the question. No, thank you very much. And and Mr. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, but Mr. Pro, I, I just looked through my package and yes, it's it's there. Okay. So um so I guess you'll ask questions if you have any if you if you read it. So we believe that the decision to approve the visitor accommodation at 706 10th Street should be overturned. The proposed visitor accommodation is outside the intended scope and parameters of the land use bylaw as discussed in our, in our submission. Specifically, we don't understand uh, how the, the uh, planning department got around clause 4.1.4, the specific use regulations does not contemplate use of the ground floor development other than for retail and offices and commercials in certain circumstances. Furthermore, in clause 4.1.8, figure 4.1.1 provides an illustration of what the expected building is going to look like. And it's very clear that it's retail on the ground floor and commercial or accommodation on the upper floors. So we haven't had an answer to that. Um, but maybe the planning department can help us when, when, they, when they get the opportunity. The, uh, and the, the planning commission, we believe, did not give proper and due consideration to the pro proposed development on the abutting residential neighborhood, also discussed in the submission. Mallard Alley is not designed or maintained as a street and simply cannot safely accommodate increased traffic flows. Our overriding concern is the safety and security of the residents of Mallard Alley and the impact of the right of quiet enjoyment on their residential homes. Uh, we did get cut off, but I, we do believe that there was a change in use of, for, from the subject visitor accommodation as the result of the recent marketed sale of the individual units. At the time of approval, the planning commission chair expressed frustration. The development feels very much like a residential accommodation and the application is for visitor accommodation. <clears throat> this implies that the building should have been reviewed under another section of the bylaw dealing with residential accommodation. Is the applicant and the developer trying to circumvent the intentions of town council and the bylaw by engaging in a two-step process to develop and sell the units at a substantial financial gain, commonly referred to as bait and switch? In addition, those who evaluated the subject visitor accommodation did so based on the interpretation of and compliance or lack of compliance of the building with certain existing bylaws. They did so apparently with little emphasis placed on who the clientele will be and what impact they may have on the peaceful existence and safety of the families of the tax paying permanent residents and property owners in proximity to the proposed building far more significance should have been placed on the consequences of housing short-term visitors in a quiet residential neighborhood without the restrictions of the number of visitors per unit and without any in-place authority to quickly deal with adverse noise and activities in and around the units. Why should the families of a tax-paying permanent residents and property owners be required to take the brunt of the impact of the operation of this building when the operations are solely for the profit of absentee landlords and the developer. As Gord mentioned, if this building was similar to the one that's housing next door uh, with retail and uh, commercial interests and residents on top, this wouldn't be an, an issue. The planning would have moved forward. 
In the planning commission minutes meetings for the July 28th under other business planning business, the commission requested that the chair write a letter to council seeking a direction on visitor use development versus residential properties and how it affects parking and bike storage on such developments, particularly adjacent to residential development. The chair agreed to prepare a letter for the council and will present it to the commission to review it at the next meeting. No timeline, unfortunately, was provided when the letter may be written, approved, submitted, or discussed with council or likely acted upon. At the planning committee meeting on August the 25th, the commission members stated that they were very uncomfortable with the approval given. Planning felt that there was no other choice given by the planning department's interpretation that parking of one space for one unit is non-negotiable and on-site management supervision and the requirement of the loading area is at the discretion of the planning department. The commission chair also indicated that the use of public transportation is understandable once visitors have arrived. However, to expect visitors to arrive using public transportation from Calgary and elsewhere is an incorrect assumption. It is submitted that it would not be fair to the residents of Mallard Alley for the appeal board to dismiss the appeal of the planning commission approval in the absence of the receipt of the response from council to the contents expressed by the, by the planning commission. Gord discussed short-term rental accommodation, including visitor accommodation, so I'll let that go. But I think it also is fair that uh, a planning, or a, 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 um, it would be unfair to dismiss the appeal in the, with the knowledge of this ongoing review. In conclusion, if there's one takeaway to all of this, it's that the residents of Mallard Alley do not want decisions that blatantly favor the absentee developer and the coffers of the town that are restricted to only deal with a bylaw that was developed several years ago is applied without regard to the taxpaying residential community in a period when the community and the town are undecided and just starting to review the short term and visitor accommodation. We strongly urge the appeal board to uphold the request to the appellates to overturn or suspend the decision of the planning commission in the absence of a new and developing information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Um, Mr. Birch. I, I have one question and uh, both Mr. Schultz and yourself said that it wouldn't be as big an issue if this building was similar to the others already on, uh, on 10th Street. Can you elaborate a little bit more of that? You, you described the one building being a mix of commercial, residential, et cetera, but are there other elements of the other uses that have been there for quite a while and don't seem to be an issue? Well, there's, uh, <clears throat> there's a restaurant on the corner, on the um, east end. There's a, uh, there's of the unit that's being proposed to be developed. Then there's the uh, newer place that was built a number of years ago, but it has a uh, real estate development or real estate uh, operation on the main floor with uh, uh, two private residences up above. Uh, and then there's some older buildings along the block. And then the, the last uh, four lots on the block are vacant. So if I could interpret from that, it's, with the building that would be next door to this proposed site, it's really the characteristics, characteristics of the mixed use that make it more acceptable. I'm Correct. just, yeah. Okay. It's, it's not, it's not design features per se. It's, it's the no, use. It's the use. It's, it's completely with the use. Mr. Chairman, if I could add to that, it's Robin Gardner again. I'm, 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 I think we're going a little bit out of order, Mr. Gardner, um, but, but go ahead, go ahead and offer your comment. Are you there, Mr. Gardner? Yeah, it was just to add to that point. Um, it's also the, um, the res full-time residential versus short-term letting use that differentiates the proposed development from the one next door. Thank you. Um, 
Ms. Coos, do you have any questions of Mr. Prohl? I have the same question for Mr. Prohl as I did uh, the other neighboring um, landowners, and that is, can you elaborate on um, the impacts, negative or positive, that will impact you directly and personally from this, um, this proposed development? Well, I think that the, the largest impact will be the usability of the, of the alley going forward if this development is approved. And, uh, and we all know that, uh, well, we all know what, one of the things is that there is a lot of traffic in morning as, as uh, restaurants along the alley get, get serviced and, and, and uh, you know, supplies get brought in. With a, with a full-time operation, full-time full hotel operation that's, that's basically going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, and, and one question before was, how do you deal with simple things like laundry? And there's no loading zone. So, the, so they say, well, you know, we'll just use the, uh, the parkade, but the parkade is gonna be full with, with vehicles. And, uh, and, and so the, the laneway is gonna become the parking lot for, for people servicing in and out, dropping off luggage, uh, picking up laundry, dropping off laundry, and whatever else. And, you know, so, so those are the types of things that, that I think are, are going to in, impact us. The other development that's going to be is, of course, if this development moves forward, it's very likely that there will be other accommodations built at the other end of the block or the, the west end of the block. There's four empty lots plus another lot that... Uh, conceivably could be developed in the, in the near future. And if you take four or five lots and you build uh, you know, 10 unit residences with 27 bedrooms on each of them, or in combination, you're gonna have uh, a real issue with traffic, parking, uh, and uh, servicing of those units. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Prohl, I only had one, one area I really wanted to clarify because I'm, I'm getting kind of a, a bit of a mixed message um, from the group. Uh, one, is, one sense I'm getting is that these units will be sold to individual owners. Is that correct? That's our understanding is that uh, the real estate information is available. It was included in your package. Yeah, yes. and, uh, and, and there have been in the, in the real estate information, when you go to their website, there have been a number of conditional sales. And then the follow-up question to that where the confusion rests with me is that I keep, I keep getting the sense that some folks think it's a hotel operation and I don't, I, don't get the, I don't get the connection between individual unit ownership and a hotel. Uh, I, can understand, I can understand a weekender buying a place like that and coming and staying in for a couple of days, taking his food and his laundry and going home. Uh, I, can, I can understand somebody wanting to advertise their particular unit as a short-term rental, but I don't get the sense it's a hotel, the way it's being implied. Well, I think <laughs> it's a distinction that's, that's difficult to make. All I'm going on, on the, uh, is the basis of, of the discussion at the planning commission meeting that was held uh, both with, uh, with this particular unit and with the one on Bow Valley Trail and the planning department referred to hotel and visitor accommodation almost interchangeably. So they look at it as, as is, and, and I hope I'm not putting words in their mouth, but, but I believe they're, they're looking at it as you got 10 units, 27 uh, bedrooms, that are going to be rented out on a short-term basis, which means they're gonna be less than 30 days. And uh, there's gonna be people coming and going all the time. And so it, it, it's, it, it's the same thing as having a hotel. Okay, Th thank you for that. Um, I, okay, I, I think that's all we have for you, Mr. Pearl. Thank you for your information. Well, thank you very much. We are there just making sure we follow up and catch everybody here. Is are there any others speaking in favor of the appeal? Mr. Chair, my name is Michael Sugarman, and I um, would like to speak in favor of the appeal. Go ahead, Mr. Sugarman. Thank you. 
Uh, I'd just like to wait till I'm brought up on the screen as well. Okay. I can say as I'm waiting that, um, oh, there we go, that I'm speaking also on behalf of my husband. We are long-term residents on Mallard Alley as well. We occupy 705 Mallard Alley, which is arguably the property most directly affected. It is directly north of the subject property right now. Um, I don't want to uh, repeat, of course, everything that was said and you've asked that we don't, we've taken a long time. And I wanted to first state that I fully support all the comments. Uh, both of us do, uh, both Doug uh, Gord, as well as Drew, as well as Janice, and as well as William. Um, having said that, I'd like to address a few things that I don't think have been addressed specifically as it relates to some of the variances and then frame a few of the issues specifically as it relates to our property or our feelings about the development. Uh, and I'd like to start really by talking about just the height variance, which no one's spoken about to date. Uh, arguably, it is relatively small and it is at the pitch. I just want to uh, mention that it's been brought up uh, in the context of the submission to yourself in terms of how administration supports it under 4.5.1.7 as allowing for 20% under the condition that it will architecturally enhance. I just want to state, number one, I should state I'm an architect uh, and an urban designer. Uh, I just want to state that it's my understanding that variances are supposed to be applied subject to benefit to the public or the community, not the development itself and the applicant. And in this case, there would be an easy answer to not requiring the, the variance, which would still allow for maintenance of the overall form, which is what's referenced in the Planning Commission document submission by administration. And that is simply to lower the building, maintain the roof slope, lower the building. It's stated also that there is no consequence to the floor area and the applicant is not looking for the two foot increment increase to increase the floor area. But I would ask you to question why that variance is requested when a simple solution of reducing the height overall would be acceptable and still the form be maintained. I also can only look at the section information that's provided in the same information you've been provided and refer specifically to the DP section that shows the dimensions on floor by floor, uh, floor to floor ratios. It is um, demonstrated and it's arguable be based on an interpretation of what the structure would be. And structure is not part of DP application, so it's hard to ascertain. And I don't wanna suggest that there's any intent to mislead by the applicant, but it is very close to what is allowable under the building code for occupiable space on the third and fourth floor, given the dimensions not, I'm assuming, provided by the applicant in their own drawings. And if you reduce by two feet, at the very least, you would have less marketable space. I just want to point that out. It feels to me like a lot of the variance requests are not at the benefit of ourselves or the community or the neighborhood. That's a good example, I feel. The decks I'd like to speak to next into the front yards. So that's on 10th Street, not our, not our side. And I'm still speaking as somebody that lives close by because I want to frame this and, and let you know that we understand, like Gord and Doug and Drew have stated, that development should and has to occur on that site. It makes sense. We invite it. We live where we live because it's close to bars and restaurants. We like walking 60 meters and heading out and having dinner. That's why we've invested a lot in that property. I wanna, the, the, there was questions asked by both um, two members of the board, by Mr. Birch and Madam Coos, and it was, as to the, it was asked of administration as to the logic for the setback. And I, I wanna provide you with that logic. It's not my own. It was actually directly provided verbatim in the submission to the Planning Commission for their review by the administration. The logic is this, it's very simple. The intended use, which is permitted, which is vacation rental, undermines the intent of 4.1.5.2 of creating a pedestrian oriented street. That isn't me speaking, that's administration and it's in a written submission. Because it undermines that, there is no reason to then hold the proponent to the setback required to create that pedestrian friendly zone. It's a really weird logic. 
it says because the use is permitted and because the use in and of itself actually sterilizes the street, hell, we, we don't need to then provide for that setback and allow for the proper beautification and interaction between the pedestrian and the users in the building. And I, I question that, not because it, it doesn't make sense today. What if in 20 years, another land use bylaw comes along or 10 years and it allows for live work. And all of a sudden somebody says, you know what, I wanna open a little shop and they do. And I can't enjoy, I can't enjoy the street as it was meant to be enjoyed. I also want to clarify something that was presented in this presentation by administration on the nature of the decks and balconies that was a direct result of your, your um, question, Michelle Cruz. And it was in my mind, um, not intentionally misleading, but Marcus, I don't think it was a, is a fulsome explanation. You looked at the plan and you presented that a certain percentage was set back. If you look at the elevation, you will find what defines the form, the edge of the development is not the setback door and window, but the structural element, the stair edge and the picketed entryway along the railings. It creates a wall at the street edge. And I invite whoever has the facility at some point to bring that up and clarify that because I think it's a bit disingenuous to suggest that a certain percentage is set back within the two meters when the form of the building is actually at the property line. So I, I'd like, I just wanted to mention that. I think it's, it's very, very clear in my mind that that's an inappropriate relaxation or variance that does not benefit the public good. And I'm part of that public and I'm proximate. I would like to briefly, we've spent a lot of time on loading and parking and I certainly shouldn't uh, re-prosecute the same arguments. I just wanted to frame it in a slightly different way. Uh, there was the question you just raised, Chair, about the difference between the hotel and the um, separately titled units that are being sold as vacation rental. And I would say that irrespective of those models, the lived experience that we have, we live right across the street. And as Doug has said, it is not it is not legitimate to assume that one stall is enough, that two or three is more often than not required. And there are no, um, there's very little, if, if not no facility on the alley itself to park except for the extreme ends. But what I really wanted to say was that if this was an apartment, let's just say that it's sold as separate units, which it is, and it's used as separate units. So it's an apartment building or it's stacked townhouses. If I go to the bylaw and I look at the parking requirements for those use, uses and typologies, it's based on the number of bedrooms and you end up with 18 stalls required plus the loading bay. So if it's being marketed in the way it's intended to be used as separately held titled, which you had just said could be somebody using it most of the month and just renting it out once in a while, it should be held to that standard. And it's not. I find that very problematic for a number of reasons, in, in, in a number of reasons. Parking is one, traffic is another. And I just want to frame this because we've all spoken about traffic, safety of children and ourselves. I want to explain a little bit about the alley just um, and why I love it so much without getting sidetracked. Um, we have to walk down the alley to get our mail and to throw out our garbage. And I choose to walk down the alley to speak to all the people that have spoken today. We've been on that alley for a long time. We are a well-functioning community in the best sense of the word. These are my friends. We take our coffee. There's no sidewalks. If there's one car that's pulled over on the side to fix somebody's window or to re-roof something, you have to jog around the car. You can't have two-way traffic when there's actually a car pulled over. Somebody has to pull into somebody's driveway to get by, which we kind of like. It's like, it's a nice feel. It feels like an alley, but it's not set up for 10 additional vehicles, let alone an additional 24 or 30, let alone the precedent setting that this will inevitably lead as an argument in the next appeal for the four lots down the street, which will be three times as large, four times as large. So 
I have a really big problem with that. If it, even if you take everybody at face value and you take the town and the administration and engineering and you say 10 stalls is enough, let's just say they're, they're a third as successful as the marketing material you have in front of you, which suggests that they would rent out every night of the year, but we know that's not gonna happen. Let's say it's only three months a year, 90 days, 100 days to make the math easy. 10 stalls going in and out once a day, twice. So that's twice a day for each unit for 100, 100 days, 2,000 times, cars are gonna come down there that don't come down there now. And that's just 90 days. And that's not the development at the end of the street. I think it's, I don't wanna say it's egregious because that seems so dramatic, but it's just not sensible. And I'm right in front of that. It's just not set up that way. I just want to speak lastly about the noise issue that I know my two neighbors uh, both addressed, Drew and um, Janice. Um, I don't need to again restate the argument, the concern for the four balconies and the parting. Uh, I just want you to know that my partner took it upon himself to contact the city in advance of this meeting to get some information on how we would deal with that. Of course, they said, you can call bylaw. As I think Janice had said, that's not when the problems arise. So then the response was, you can contact the RCMP. That's fair. So we contacted the RCMP. The RCMP let us know that, of course, they'll address the issue, but they will do so in priority of other calls. The nature of this particular call, I would hope they would put low down the ladder. I wish they wouldn't, but I'm assuming they have better things to do than a whole bunch of calls for me, which there will be. And then not, all, not only that, then they said, how do they address that when my husband asked the question? Well, they can go out and they can give a ticket, but they generally don't ticket anybody that's short term because there's no point because they don't pay. And they don't generally ticket the owner because the owner isn't the person that actually created the infraction. So really at the end of the day, there's no on-site management as we've said, and we understand the bylaw was written at a time when even that technology didn't really allow for and didn't contemplate this type of use. So it, it's complicated. I, I, I'm not saying there's an easy answer. We just feel that if I step back and summarize now, and, and if you have questions or admin wants to address anything, I would have to just say that, you know, technically we get that this is a permitted use right now. And if you accept that logic, a lot of dominoes fall and you can see how bylaws being met and you can come to one conclusion. Alternatively, you can conclude that really the classification itself as Doug started the presentation is relatively new. It's poorly understood in terms of both its application and its impact. It's under current review. And it really wasn't contemplated to begin with in the town center district as an at grade use, which then sterilizes the street. And on top of that, you've got us. We're this really cohesive neighborhood and we are an abutting neighborhood to a commercial district with all the implications and the requirement to minimize, not to, not to find a balance. That's not how it's written. It could have been written that way. It's to minimize the impact on us. And that's clearly not being done. And then on top of all of that, the last point being, all of these decisions are made in the absence of the umbrella document that really should govern how we view and interpret these, and that would be the downtown master plan that would be current, relevant, and inspired and supported by the town, by the residents, by us. And that we know has been put on hold till 23. And in the absence of that governance, that governing document, there's a, a, a lack of framework. And the framework in a, then makes governance, which is now unfortunately your job, very, very difficult. And so all we can do, myself, my husband, my neighbors, is appeal to your logic, your sensibility, to see that this is an ad hoc decision that by the city and administration's own admission will sterilize 10th Street, and by our lived experience, will compromise our use and enjoyment under 4.1.5.9. And so I also, on behalf of both my husband and myself, ask that you support the appeal and reject the development as proposed. And I really do thank you very, very much, and administration, I thank their, their involvement as well. Thank you for your time and your effort in this. Thank, thank you, Mr. Sugarman. Um, Mr. Birch, questions? I have uh, a couple. Um, so you said lowering the building by a couple of feet might 
uh, alleviate the need for the height relaxation. We heard from the planning department that the uh, the water level is high, which doesn't surprise me there. Is there an offset that I'm missing? Like they've raised it because of the water table and, or did, did you mean something else? No, what I, well, I'll clarify what I meant and that's a good question. I didn't mean lower the ground floor. I meant collapse the building. So the section gets a little shorter at each level. So, so keep the ground floor push the roof down, maintain the slope of the roof, and each floor gets a little shorter. It's less marketable, it's less desirable. It does compromise the top floor and the top floor loft bedroom, but it's doable. And so, so for, uh, I'm not an architect, but so slightly lower roof heights or ceiling heights. Yeah, slightly lower instance. ceiling heights, exactly. Yep. The diff um, yeah. Okay. And Things of that nature. You could you can make floors thinner by construction techniques. Yeah, or you could spend more money on very thin construction assemblies instead of typical construction assemblies. I, I'm not suggesting that the architect did anything wrong at all. I mean, I actually think it's a well-designed and nice-looking building. What I'm getting at is the, the priority seems to be on the proponent's development at the cost of the neighborhood and myself as a property owner. And my concern in this presentation is not their interests it's mine and my communities okay one of the sections of the land use bylaw talks about increasing the height of the roof uh and relaxations etc provided they don't increase the livable space and you mentioned something about that in terms of the use of the upper they're not lost but the upper stories can you elaborate a little bit on that? I can. Um, I don't want to make any conclusions in this regard because again, it's subject to the structural assemblies, a term we use for how you build a floor or how you build a ceiling and how thin you can make that or how thick it gets. But the dimensions that are provided on the drawings show for uh, the top of a floor to the top of a floor. And those dimensions allow for, based on certain assumptions of standard construction, certain ceiling heights. And that's fine. But when you get to the topmost floor, the third floor that has that four story bedroom, you'll notice, and it's in, um, excuse me for looking, but I think it's in DP 1.5. Um, let's see, sorry, what is the DP? Sorry, I said that backwards, DP 5.1. There is a section drawing, building section, 1D, DP 5.1, and it actually gives you, um, as well as the other sections, some numbers. And if you back out what would be an assumed one foot for the structure between the uppermost bedroom and the space below it, you actually get very close to what is a building code maximum minimum for occupiable height. Now, again, that's all dependent on structure. Somebody could come back and say, Michael, you're making a whole bunch of presumptions. We're going to spend a lot of money on steel and keep this really thin. But that's not in the documents. The way it reads to me, I could flip it around and just ask, pose this. Why would you go for a variance, which is always an issue, unless you got something out of it that was really important? I mean, what would that be? I think it's additional headroom on a couple floors that are very close to being unmarketable or that actually fall below building code allowable heights. But I, I really don't want to, I can't tell you that for a fact. It, it's not appropriate at me, Greg. And then just the last point, which you referenced the Ms. Kuz's questions and I had some of the same thoughts is, is the front massing or, or extensions of those decks uh, uh, from the ground, well, it's, it's above ground level all the way up. Yeah. As an architect, your sense of that in terms of the bylaw requirement for variations, uh, do you want to just elaborate a little bit more about what your thought was on that? Because yeah, okay, Ms. Cruz I and I had some of the same senses, I think. I think that it's complicated often in reviewing drawings to review the building as a whole, even though the architect provided very good three-dimensional drawings. 
And the initial review is generally a plan review. And in plan, the submission includes highlighted areas that do demonstrate a setback and they even call it up in a certain way to promote that way of thinking. And buildings have a definition and decks and railings fall outside an enclosed area. So technically there's lots of reasons to say that's the building and where it sits. But then one should, in my opinion, especially when they have the responsibility of managing the public good, look at the reality of the building form in elevation and in three dimensions and evaluate where the, the impact is in the public realm. And clearly, as you, you've seen yourself, and you're the ones that brought it up initially, there's concern with the impact of those balconies, but it's not because what they do in plan, it makes no difference in plan, it's what they do in elevation and in section. And I do think somebody asked, you know, and it's a, I think the answer was very good of administration as well, what should they do in this case if they didn't do that? I forget what the question was referencing exactly. It's very difficult to know what an architect would do because I like to think we're creative and there's lots of solutions that one can um, propose. So I do think there's always other solutions that I'm a believer in. Um, one very simple one, again, it just compromises the saleable square foot. You push everything back. You just say no. But administration says no, there's no benefit to the public for doing that. Stick with what you're supposed to stick to. And guess what? You have less square feet to sell. I mean, I'm a big believer in development too. I wanna to say that I work for developers, but I also am a big believer in the public good. That side affects me because it's a downtown face and I live downtown and I want to enjoy it. I never will. Thank you, Mr. Sugarman. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Um, Ms. Coos. Thank you, Chairman. Um... A couple of questions. The first question has to do with um, your thoughts, Mr. Uh, Sugarman, on the building structure itself. Um, the definition of development um, in the LUB uh, relates to change of use, change of intensity of use, and change of building um, on the proposed law, the, on the development. And you um, raised um, as a point that this is either an apartment building or a stacked townhouse. Um, so you, you've gone beyond just change of use um, and the change of intensity of use that could impact on you and the other residents of Mallard Alley. I'm just wondering if you could classify or if you know enough to classify what the new or the proposed structure is, whether it's an apartment building or a stacked townhouse, because the LUB requirements differ depending on that. Um, and um, having reviewed that, um, you made mention of 18 stalls, I think. Yes. I was just wondering if you could comment a bit more or elaborate on what your understanding was of the, the bylaw having looked at that. Yeah, I think I understand your point, but please do interrupt if I, if I don't and get sidetracked. Um, I think part of the issue here that I'm facing and my neighbors are facing is there is no clear answer to your question because we also don't really understand the definition of visitor accommodation. I mean, there's a clear definition. It's a couple sentences long. It does involve the parameters around how long somebody can stay in the unit, as you know. And so it suggests that it's not for residency, very clearly. So that would suggest it's not an apartment building or a townhouse. It's being marketed as vacation rental. Uh, if you look at the um, revenue that they're expecting to generate, even at $300 a night, you'd have to rent them literally every day of the year. So it is from a, I, I don't know if the right term is legal point of view, but it is designated as a permitted use as vacation rental. It is being sold as, sorry, vacation accommodation, visitor accommodation, I apologize. Um, but it de facto is being sold to individual unit holders and there's very little parameter around how that use is defined or any regulations or bylaws set to define it within the town center um, district. Whereas in other districts, there are accommodation made for certain um, impacts that are anticipated from vacation, from visitor accommodation. So here there's none. So we have nothing that governs 
um, anything uh, like the size of vehicle that's going to come and park in a certain area, the type of vehicle that's allowed into that area, any time, any, um, any use throughout the day that may be required that's different from simply visitor accommodation, like coming to actually clean. There's no parameters around that in terms of use. Um, so I think it's very, it's unclear to us because it's not defined how this, how this particular use that's permitted will impact our enjoyment because there's nothing that defines how it should impact our enjoyment. So it's easier for us to look at it as either a hotel, and then we kind of all have a picture in our heads of what that means, or as individual condominiums that are actually gonna be rented out on an ad hoc basis without anybody that is supposed to be living there because they're not supposed to live there. That's actually the way visitor accommodation reads. Like it says, it's not for residency. So I'm not really clear in my answer because we're not really clear either. As far as it relates to the question of parking in my reading of bylaw, I just wanted to demonstrate that if I read it as apartment or uh, stack townhouse, that very clearly there's a parking ratio required that is based on bedrooms. That to myself and most of my neighbors who I've spoken to in advance feel is a more reasonable way of looking at parking requirements at a minimum, because we look at the lived experience of the visitor accommodation that we already have on our alley and it grossly exceeds one per unit. So I'm repeating myself now, ma'am. I'm not sure that I'm answering your question. Um, th that's helpful. Thank you. Um, my other, the other part of that question is, what would you characterize the proposed building as? Um, an apart would you consider it an apartment building or a stacked townhouse, just based on your experience as an architect? Well, uh, again, I'm sorry, but it's not my, as... And if you don't know the answer, that's fine. No, I just want to um, differentiate. As an architect, it's a certain number of floors, a certain number of bedrooms, it has a certain number of entries, and those could be appropriate for either use. As an experienced architect working with a lot of development, it feels to me more like a townhouse or apartment building, but that isn't me speaking as an architect, if that clarifies things. Thank you. I have no other questions, Chairman Locke. Thank you very much, Ms. Cruz. Uh, Mr. Sugarman, just, just one further question. You alluded to the other, I think you said four lots, which are likely to be developed at some point in the future, a little further west. Um, that, as that it does evolve, even if it complies with the current uh, commercial on the, on the ground floor and uh, accommodation on the upper floors, is, is that that's gonna definitely have an impact on on Mallard Alley residents as well, is it not? I mean, or is that just, you just accept that that's the kind of development that is accept, accept, expected there and, and, can, and they're prepared to live with it? Um, well, speaking for myself, uh, the short answer is absolutely it would have a huge impact regardless of what it is, it will. We see, I feel, myself, my husband, that we expect that to be developed we would hope that it would be developed if it, into a mixed use building and that if there is residential, as um, Robin had said, that it would be residential that has permanent residence so that there is a sense of ownership and community. We would also hope that the access to parking absolutely is not from the alley. And I realize that it is encouraged for commercial or mixed use to have rear alley access to parking but not where it abuts a residential neighborhood. So that's again, one of the fundamental flaws or difficulties in wrestling with this issue. So absolutely, we will have issues with that. And we would have issues with again, the same visitor accommodation use, unless there are parameters that get developed in the future around, around what that means. And that we could have input into that, we should have. I mean, we're the only R2 abutting commercial in the TC as far as I'm aware and um, no one's asked us anything yet. You know, I hope that they do. Um, yeah, so definitely, definitely a huge impact. We are worried about this as a precedent. Um, that isn't this proponent's issue, I realize that. I mean, it's almost unfair to lay that on them, but it is inevitably, um, it's just inevitable that it gets used that way. 
regardless of what even administration may want to support or not, um, developers will use that. Did, did uh, Mr. Sugarman, did your community have the opportunity to have input into the land use bylaw at its last revision? I mean, most communities advertise it and seek input and, and uh, are looking for those kinds of comments. Would you and will you participate in those reviews as they come forward? Yeah, I should clarify. We've owned uh, for a long time on Mallard Alley, but we have only recently in the last um, year and a half uh, sold our other property and made it our permanent residence. And we're very, very excited and happy about that. And we're actually investing in improving our property uh, right now. Um, and absolutely, I will be engaged. Um, I hope to be engaged in a number of levels, uh, as well as my partner, but myself, given my experience, I hope to get intimately engaged in that as well as the town uh, plan. I, I think the town center plan is a critical framework document that's missing. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Sherman. That's all the questions the board has. I thank you for your input and participation. Thank you. So I'll move on to any others that would be like to speak in favor of the appeal. Melissa Jay. Hello, hello yes. Um, this is uh, Dr. Philip Vanner Merva. Uh, I just, uh, Listen to my husband's presentation, and obviously, I'm I concur um, with uh, with his uh, his notions. I also want to thank um, all our neighbors um, who have uh, presented and shown up for this. Um, it is a wonderful, um, very respectful, and safe uh, community. Um, and uh, and we're you know, as somebody has alluded to the fact, we're not anti development. We do understand that things will happen. We're not, we're not into nimbyism, but um, clearly, um, you know, we have certain very unique uh, challenges on the alley. Um, and I do not need to speak to any of those, um, but uh, just maybe add one thing. When I did speak to the RCMP, they indicated that they have seen a significant rise in noise complaints over the last uh, few years. Um, and um, again, so, you know, it's just also something that our town will face. And uh, clearly we want to make sure that our resources, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, to law enforcement um, is respected and, um, and mitigated so that uh, they don't uh, end up uh, attending to things that are not really uh, necessary or, or is avoidable. Um, you know, we don't want to end up in the same, uh, same place as we did with the ambulances that we often don't have in Canmore because of larger issues. Um, I want to thank uh, the committee and, uh, and uh, councillors and administration for all your hard work and attention. Thank you for taking this time. Thank you, Mr. Vandermeer. Um, Mr. Birch, do you have any questions of Mr. Vandermeer? No, I do not. Ms. Coos? No, I do not. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Vandermeer. We'll uh, move then to, I think it was Miss Melissa Jay was uh, just in there at the same time as Dr. Vandermeer. So maybe, perhaps Miss Jay, you could proceed with your presentation. Thanks, Chair Locke. Yeah, um, so I'll start my video. Hi, I'm Dr. Melissa Jay. I am speaking from um, ownership across the street on 10th in the Mastea Place building. And I just want to thank everyone for their time today and really appreciate all the neighbors that are coming out and, and sharing why they are in support of this appeal. I too am in support of this appeal and yeah, I want to just amplify everything that's been shared, especially related to the parking, which will become a bigger problem and already is. And also around the four variants, variances to the building height. Um, so our, our unit is located on the main floor in Mustaya Place, and we love it because we have mountain views. And so even if someone builds even a little bit out of the scope of what they're allowed to, it takes away what, what it is that brings us here to the mountains, and it is those mountains, right? And so this, this project is really taking up all of the land space. And and when we take up the land, there's no space for the things that have, have to happen around that everyone has spoken to. So the traffic becomes a problem. Um, and, and then also just like the construction is going to be a big issue for a very long time. And so I just want to say that I'm absolutely opposed to this if they, but I really appreciate what, um, 
Sugarman, you just shared, Michael Sugarman, you just shared that, you know, lowering it, we, we support development and want the downtown to continue thriving. And yet this doesn't seem to align with all of the bylaws and building codes. So that's all from me. Thank you, Ms. J. Any questions, Mr. Birch? No, I do not. Thank you. Ms. Coos, any questions? Not for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jay. That's all from the board. Um, we'll move then to in, any others speaking in favor of the appeal. Mr. Chair, my name's uh, Bill Laws. Yes, Mr. Laws, please proceed. Um, I recently moved to um, Canmore uh, and in particular Mallard Alley with my wife, Julie Bradner. Uh, may I say to start with, I think this is maybe the friendliest and strongest community we've lived in. Um, I understand that visitor accommodation is an uh, approved uh, use, I think uh, the terminology is, but uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that within the land use bylaw, there is no definition of uh, the minimum or maximum number of units within any particular visitor accommodation um, are including that definition. And we believe that in this community, abutting a residential district, the size of this uh, development is not appropriate. Um, we're not, again, we're not against developments in any form. In fact, we welcome uh, a more appropriate type of development, maybe maybe whether it's a smaller size visitor accommodation, uh, but more particularly retail or say food and drink that actually service um, the new visitors, whether they're day use or overnight stairs uh, that are brought in. I, th I believe that a development of this size would be more appropriate um, elsewhere in Canmore and would have a would benefit the community of Canmore, but uh, may I suggest that say Railway Ave or Bow Valley Trail would be more appropriate. Again, that's not my call, obviously. Um, secondly, uh, I, I noticed uh, both at the uh, previous hearing and at this, the administration, I think it's um, planning and development twice referred issues that uh, we were concerned with, parking and traffic, and said rather than, uh, as a, in my understanding, was that rather than address them now, they regard it as more appropriate to uh, address them later. But uh, I have a problem with that in that, for one thing, to even um, identify what the solution would be in future. I think first you have to identify what the actual problem is. And I, I don't think that parking and uh, traffic have even been acknowledged as problems yet. And so I don't know whether we can, how we can say solutions will be available in future if we haven't even identified the specific problem. And for instance, the uh, width of the alley is fixed, it seems to me. So, for instance, widening the alley would not be a possible future solution to traffic. Um, and uh, one particular uh, problem that I see with uh, traffic is, uh, I understand that uh, very shortly, uh, the fire our, uh, servicing fire hall will move from literally almost around the corner to, I believe it's uh, Palliser Trail, um, which will result in access from the fire hall to us, uh, very possibly being um, hindered by a train, train tracks at any time. Uh, and there is no, um, there's no access behind our property. So the only access uh, for emergency vehicles is from the front of the property. So any uh, future traffic 
in the in the uh, community uh, the results from this uh, residential accommodation and future uh, sorry visitor accommodations that will follow would be of uh, serious concern to our um, of serious concern to us with regard to safety and possibly even a uh, liability issue for council. Um, I strongly believe that 4.1.5.9 um, is breached by this property. And uh, I again move, I, I again ask the board uh, to agree with that. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Laws. Mr. Birch. I have no questions. Thank you. Ms. Coos? None for me, thank you. Uh, and none for myself, Mr. Laws. Thank you very much for thank your you. time today and participation. We will then move to any others that are in favor of the appeal. Are there any others? One more chance. Are there any others in wanting to speak in favor of the appeal? All right, then perhaps we can move on then. And uh, I, I believe, Ms. Noel, that we have already been provided the additional information that came to us today as it went to all of the others. So I don't think there is any additional correspondence in favor of the appeal, is there? Uh, did we receive two letters? Uh, correspondence in favor of the appeal and then one letter that was late that I did circulate. That's correct. Okay, so yeah. we have it all. That's that's good. Thank you very much. Those will all be entered into evidence. Uh, I would now ask those speaking in opposition to the appeal to come forward and give their names and make and make their presentations. Who, are there any presenters speaking in opposition to the appeal? The chair. My name is Chad Russell, an applicant on the file, and I would like to speak in opposition to the appeal. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Why don't you just go ahead and, and make your presentation then? Sounds good. I'd like to do a quick screen share here. I'll run through a brief presentation and uh, just provide an overview and be here to answer any questions as they've, uh, uh, they may arise. Thank you. So just to make sure that you can see this. Uh, is uh, is that screen on that uh, has a bit of a cover with the uh, uh, front rendering for everyone? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, first off, I would just like to say uh, thanks for everyone's time here today. Um, I, I truly do appreciate the concerns along the back alley. Um, and uh, have compassion for these interfaces. I, I do wanna keep my presentation and uh, discussion kind of truly rooted in the planning rationale and void of subjective commentary. That is how we've approached this site. And, um, and I'd also like to thank administration. I thought that they did a very fair and uh, accurate presentation uh, on the application. And so with that, I'll just kind of dive right into it. Uh, primarily, I'll just speak to kind of the four, the four variances. I'll add some information that hasn't been touched on, and I'd also like to add a little bit more on the background as uh, how we approached this site and some of the work to date that, that preceded our application, and then kind of like ultimately where it landed, and a little bit more kind of where it currently sits. Uh, this I'll just kind of skim over. We've already seen this, just some information as to the site and context. Uh, everyone's very well versed here. Obviously zero setbacks on the side, 5.4 on the rear. And this is noting kind of the minimum, but uh, one on the front. And as we know, maximum of two. Uh, back in uh, spring, specifically kind of March 9th, uh, we submitted a pre-application meeting uh, to administration on this file. And, and what you're seeing on the screen here is uh, that pre-application site plan. And a couple like main pieces to kind of just highlight here is that uh, at the time there was a combination of tourist home and visitor accommodation. And so uh, 
the site layout's a little bit different. I'll speak to that a little bit more in one second, but general approach, as we know, kind of two distinct, distinct buildings, uh, south and a north, uh, access along the western edge of the site, parking being accessed off the lane, uh, surface parking kind of underneath the building and being visually screened, also waste and recycling in a screened area under the building. Uh, architectural style, looking for kind of like strict conformance to town guidelines, this being kind of like Rocky Mountain architecture that, uh, that you've seen in our images thus far, significant portions of stone on the front, timber detailing uh, and low maintenance materials, uh, sedimentitious siding with large openings to, to capture uh, views for inside the unit and also to like help an animate those facades uh, with a high degree of openings. And the unit mixes as they still stand today, kind of mix of two beds, two bed press den and three bedroom units um, in a bit of a loft format, which will be uh, fairly diverse in the market typology there for visitor comp. Uh, as we made our application for that pre-app and that meeting, there were a few items that we wanted to specifically discuss. And again, with this current site plan that was on here at the time, current at the time, uh, there was essentially three stall variants that was being looked after, look, looked for pursuit, two stalls plus a cash in lieu. And we wanted to just kind of gauge that uh, perspective from the town to see how it would be received. Uh, to a lesser degree, kind of bicycle parking, the massing along 10th Street, um, the roof line in terms of uh, stepping that front back and the building height. Um, this being, uh, as we've kind of like said, it was a little bit different at the time. It was a little bit uh, uh, greater uh, in terms of the height that was being discussed and um, how that would be perceived from planning and the context related to the bylaw. Um, this was obviously, as we talked about, and you've seen significantly lower than the adjacent property, but uh, in that vein being quite contextually appropriate. And then further to that, the balcony setback. Um, this is a, a kind of like second and third floor uh, being a, the ones that are above four meters projecting kind of one meter into the front and rear setbacks. Uh, what came back from that, uh, from that meeting uh, was that the planning did not see rationale for var varying the uh, parking. Uh, 10 accommodation units with only eight parking stalls, they just felt wouldn't function practically, even if there were some shared parking agreements that could have been in place Cash and Lou has better for shorter occupancies, not specific with this use. And, um, and we kind of had that to take away as one of our bigger kind of redesign exercises to see how we could incorporate it. Um, bicycle parking might be adequate based on how it's designed uh, that we developed and addressed later. Uh, planning was generally satisfied with the aesthetic and appreciated the, uh, the contribution to that Canmore's Rocky Mountain architectural character. Um, the variances related to the massing appeared uh, supportable based on the current plan, but there was a number of questions related to seven meter eave line, how that was gonna be detailed. Not all of this information was available during the pre-app, which was subsequently submitted. And as you know, uh, deemed to be in their view supportable. The building height um, said, yes, this, is, this would be a variance, but based on the design, it's supportable as it aligns, aligns with the town's character. And the balcony uh, setback, basically kind of saying, uh, we're gonna have to have a little bit of additional discussion. Again, that, that applies to both the North and the South at the time of this uh, application. On the front, it doesn't overwhelm, overwhelm or overlook uh, due to the fact that it is in the kind of like true street public realm and that, um, further study was on that. So this is just some background as it relates to uh, pre-application that happened uh, in the spring and kind of where we took it from there. I'll elaborate upon uh, a little bit further. So this is the site plan as it stands today. And as everyone knows and is familiar with here today, 
uh, there are 10 stalls that are being provided, uh, which meets both the minimum and maximum as the per the bylaw. Uh, we reduced the main floor building footprint by about 200 square feet to adjust and to accommodate those additional stalls. As again, just a bit of a uh, change and a revision to the application based on the discussions that we were having with the town. I think it's always important to provide a little bit of this background and that, you know, these designs don't kind of come together. We land on something and, and we put a stamp on it and, and it's a done deal. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a great deal of, uh, um, you know, trying to, trying to kind of get the right balance and i mean again i i do believe that's what's being achieved here as it relates to the bylaw specific to parking especially high schools there's a requirement for two we've got six plus all units are designed to incorporate long-term stalls so that exceeds the bylaw and the building massing uh long tenth we created some adjustments since that pre-app for a better alignment with the bylaw and um that included uh, at the time of the initial submission, there was a bit of an eave overhanging the uh, 45 minute degree uh, line. And uh, we've pulled that back for uh, again, better compliance with bylaw. As you know, that's not uh, listed as a variance because it's not required. The building height, uh, kind of much discussion here, a little bit of like detailed numbers, but we're talking about uh, two feet. And this applies to the very small portion of, of the ridge and the peak. And, and from our side and from the context and from discussions with the plant, with the town, that is a, a full kind of over four feet lower than the adjacent parcel, 1330 as surveyed. And so when we talk about a four story building and we're looking at two, two feet and we're looking at an adjacent parcel that is significantly higher, um, that's a very that's a variance from our side that was worth going after due to kind of improving those those units. We've heard a lot of discussion on that, but again, in the context, uh, this is this is a very minor piece, and uh, and as such, that's how we've approached the application and submitted this document. And then the balcony projection, uh, the south elevation does propose balconies uh, into the setback. Uh, by by one meter on the rear and I can get into this a little bit more we had that same one meter projection and due to perceived pushback from the community we thought it was in the best interest of our the, our client and the community to pull those back in so that they are not uh, projecting into the rear setback at all and I can go into that a little bit further I got a couple images to help show you. Uh, what that looks like, um, but I, I do want to say I've you know heard some discussion like what what is a one to two meter setback? What, you know what's the intent of that? And and again we talk about the intent of it is to create a pedestrian friendly environment. And uh, I think it's really important here to like decipher that the a one to two meter one maximum two or one minimum two maximum is really trying to make a tight street section and you, you get that pedestrian activity by framing the street i also sit on as the chair of the calgary's urban design Re review committee and so the, a more detrimental piece there is a greater setback at the front where the framing of the street is eroded and you're not able to have that same uh, kind of corridor down down the street. So as far as the intent goes, uh, I would definitely argue that we're in alignment with that. Um, the building obviously isn't in that setback and projecting into the setback and just the balconies and further, that's a small portion of balconies on uh, levels two and three only. So kind of looking at that piece, here we are, you've seen a similar slide. This is one that we created, but very similar to what uh, planning created. Uh, I'd also like to say it's from a height perspective, just on the peak, that's a 5.5% variance compared to like the three meters above grade. And again, you start to see the difference in kind of size uh, to the adjacent parcel and amassing that again, when this adjacent parcel, if it's ever redeveloped, you know, this was very contextually appropriate and um, the degree difference here is not it's not going to be perceived from 
great. It, it, it really won't be. We, I do a lot of work on projects like this. Um, and I, I, can assure, I can assure you that two feet on the top of a building uh, is not going to be perceived by, mm -hmm. by anyone, even if you're looking for it. But that is kind of the degree of discussion that we're having here. And again, trying to make sure that it's aligned with the bylaw and we felt that it was appropriate due to its context. On the south elevation, just looking at kind of like this is the, the second and third and third floor is very similar to the amount that's that's popping out here. Kind of like highlighted is the, the degree of uh, projection into the setback of that balcony only. Um, when we talk about how it, it animates the, the facade and alignment to the intent of the bylaw and some questions to, well, what would we do if, you know, what why, why not just say push it back? And, you know, if as you look at this front elevation and what, it hap and what happens here, uh, it could just get pushed back. It would, it would be, it would have less articulation. I do not think it would add to the pedestrian environment. I think it would detract from it. And that's why it's, that's why we uh, submitted it the way we did. But again, if you, if you did just push it back, take a little bit of area out of the unit, um, I think what, when you look at how that is for the public good, it, it now would conform to the bylaw. That variance isn't required. Why would we go after the variance? Uh, it's because we think it's a better project with it. Uh, net result is sure it'll add a little bit of area um, in the unit, but a, a bigger piece of that, in, in my opinion, is we think it's, it looks better and has a better feel on the street. So that, that's kind of just a little bit more background as to uh, that balcony on the front and kind of glazed over is here's the rear elevation and you can see we did the exact same thing here so and it is possible i'm not i'm not putting something forward that's not possible i just feel that this facade has the exact same sorts of proportions as the front with no meter cantilever of the deck again it, it did at one time our original submission on may 20th had it bump out and the architectural expression here was closer to the front, uh, but due to that, the perceived objection and wanting to be in better um, standing there with our neighbors, we, we pulled it back in so that there's no, there's no variance here on the north elevation. And so that's, that's a condition of approval that's been coordinated that it has, is in with the town and that that's our current, our current design. Um, two more here. When we talk about the loading stall, you know these are these are very these, this is a very small natured development. You know, there's a lot of discussion as is this you know is it residential? It's visitor accommodation, and visitor accommodation is a is a commercial use. And with that, the 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 biggest thing that's going to be happening here is somebody cleaning the units. When somebody's cleaning the unit. They're gonna, they're gonna know they need to come to clean a unit and that parking stall will not be occupied. So it, truly there's no, there's no need for a loading stall. That's typical with other developments in and around town, but even if those don't set the precedent, uh, the fact of the matter is a, a loading stall is, is, is far more than a size of this development would require. And as such, we submitted it without it. And then the last one is, is the entry feature at the front that, that faces the street and sidewalk. We've been working with administration. This was not perceived to be an issue from our side or from their side. And we have kind of like, we're kicking it around back and forth. This is pretty much like, as you see, it is, is kind of where it stands today. We've looked at a few options to create an element on the corner at the entry. That's also what this piece is intended to do kind of in the back, but it's tucked around a little bit and you don't get it from both sides. So now just bringing something forward a bit more that, that delineates that, um, that entry into the interior of the site. And so this is kind of underway and, um, and we were pretty close on that piece. And so I do anticipate that there'll be a number of, of questions here. And so I'll, I'll stop the presentation short here. And um, I'll start uh, screen sharing uh, if we need to go back to anything. But for now, I'll turn that off and um, and uh, pause the presentation for answering some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and everyone on the call. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Um, 
Mr. Birch. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll go to the questions that I warned you of, so to speak. Um, so the cleaning staff comes in, they have presumably a vehicle carrying out laundry where, and I understand that, yes, uh, you know, when they're cleaning, there's a vacant unit, but we've kind of heard that parking is going to be in short supply. Uh, and so I'm just wondering how you think that the, the cleaning staff and, and laundry will, will be undertaken here. Sure. Thank you. And through the chair, um, maybe, uh, uh, again, always a lot of information on the architectural plans and easy to miss kind of bits and pieces of it, but every unit is supplied with, uh, with the washer and dryer. So depending on how these individual owners would like to operate it, um, there is the pot, there is the potential to be using some of the, the in-house washer dryers. Um, but also kind of just, just to say that, you know, the, due to the scale of this, these, it wouldn't be if it was going out through commercial cleaning or pickup, which uh, may or may not, um, you know, that the, the biggest sized vehicle that would, would be doing that could be, is no bigger than the vehicle that would be parking in the stall. We're not talking about a large uh, cube van or something to that effect. So um, again, with the, uh, the vacancy in the unit when it's getting cleaned, if there's, the sheets are going out with the cleaning service or if they're being done in the unit, uh, I think that it, that that requirement will be met um, by nature of the the stall that's open because no one's in that unit. Just uh, just extending on that. So, are the parking stalls assigned with each unit? Uh, or, fair or are they open? Yeah, fair question. That goes a little bit to future operations. So I'd be speaking a little bit out of school to say that. Um, uh, if they were or were not assigned. Um, and uh, so we've seen, I've seen operators kind of do it, do it both ways, to be honest. And uh, I couldn't say 100%. Yeah. In that context, will this be a condominium development? Uh, through the chair, I, uh, based on this type of development, I would anticipate that to be the case. And so maybe as an extension to another question there that, uh, just a statement that nobody's nobody's watching, nobody's nobody's gonna like. There'll be no one there to call. I, I do anticipate that there will be a condo board. There will be groups through that board that are responsible for maintenance on the building, for snow removal, for uh, those sorts of things, and including complaints. And so there will be some internal governance because it will be in every but every individual owner's best interest to have. Uh, the adjacent unit, for example, conforming to the same the same laws, and if there's a complaint, I would anticipate on a project like this that that body would be the one who's there and will be helping to oversee um, that on an internal basis, so that um, you know it's not like there isn't someone to call. I do believe there actually will be because that body will be I anticipate it to be in place again a bit of an operations piece, but just based on what I've seen on similar developments. So I, I'm just thinking if, if it is a condominium, uh, you can assign the parking spot to a unit if, 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 if the condominium bylaws are set up that way. Um, but also it, it would potentially, um, uh, because it it's, would have 10 owners, uh, have, have potentially 10 cleaning staff arriving at the same time or total uncoordination. I, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm just thinking of the, the concerns of adjoining landowners and the parking and the street traffic and whatnot. So um, I'm, I'm just thinking of and trying to understand how it will work. Um, just with regards to the front entrance way, uh, which, as I said, my, my first questions uh, has not been resolved with the town and is, is in flux and, and there's a proposal, you kind of showed some drawings. And so that, that is what, the thought is, is, is that uh, what, what you illustrated would be the proposed front entrance fix for that condition? Yes, through the chair. Uh, so just kind of sharing that, you know, again, when we have those conditions that are pretty typical on, on developments, and if there's something that's relatively in, in the town's uh, opinion, 
fairly easy to uh, resolve and not something that would hold up the decision. Um, those are some of the pieces that we've been studying and been working with the town. And so none of those are finalized. Those were kind of just uh, flashed up and, and not that I uh, want to kind of like focus on them too much, except to say that um, we're active, we're active in resolving that. It's not foreseen to be um, uh, significant and, and our interactions going back and forth is that we're, we're quite close on a resolve there and, um, and that condition will be met. Uh, next question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and this is more curiosity than <laughs> than has to do with the with the uh, appeal. But the building is is attached and yet divided into two elements. And can you just explain why that is the case? Why wouldn't it just be one unit? Uh, sure, or uh, through the chair, or, or one building. Not to put words. Yes, yeah, what one building? I'm sorry, yeah. you're correct. But, uh, Okay, thank you. And, and again, through the chair, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting typology. And uh, I do think that um, in these kind of mountain environments where everyone's, you know, everyone's there to enjoy the outdoors, and be outdoors, it's, it's potentially more fitting than other environments where you come into a building and you come into a common space and you go down a hallway and, you know, that hallway is obviously lit and and heated and maintained with interior finishes before you enter your unit on um, on projects like this we've seen a really good kind of uptick in uh, for a few reasons but the uh, the user groups have you know they they found it to be they found it to be appropriate but from an architect's perspective what i like on this sort of a project is um you know, from one, the, the, that sense of place when you leave your unit and you're outside, you don't have to go into a common area. And and during the times of like COVID, it's like kind of like put that a little bit more where it's not enclosed space and, and you've got fresh air that's, that's natural. And from a sustainability perspective, uh, you know, the finishes are very like very basic. They're, they're low maintenance, you know, s steel stairs and, um, and uh, a very, very, very well, low maintenance, durable finishes, but not, not carpet that needs to get replaced. And you're not enclosing air that needs to be heated and continually ventilated. So it actually makes for a more sustainable product. That's, that's, you know, maybe it's moving the needle a little bit, but it's more towards an environmentally sensitive discussion because you're cutting down operation costs. Okay. I, I, the, the question did have context because, of course, we're looking at the relaxation in the front yard. And I was just thinking arbitrarily that if you squeeze that area out, you could pull your building back. So I, I wanted to understand why why it was opened up in the middle, if you will. Um, and, and, and you've explained that very well. Thank you. I, I understand. Um, and then the final one would just be with the issue of the front front setback if you will and and the decks versus the um the requirement for variations and whatnot and and some of the concern that has been expressed is that the decks will be really close to well they'll, they'll be overhanging almost the, the street uh, back a, a few centimeters i suppose but um it was was there an alternative i think you talked about an alternative at one time you and you thought it would not be as attractive. Can you just elaborate a bit on about the alternative? Uh, yes, through the chair, I'll I'll just kind of pull up the same. I can I can go through a couple different uh, visuals, but I think for for simplicity, I'm just going to share uh, that same document and uh, just kind of flip between uh, a couple different images uh, in that document. So. Bear with me on the screen, I, I presume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, it is. so again, back to, back to the front bit of the dusk image, you can kind of see how we've got this building form. It steps, the, the masses are kind of like, you know, the, what we kind of like, you know, in terms of our thesis and approach to the massing, kind of like these two uh, stone kind of bookends and then a good portion of the building pushed back and and yes there are some decks uh, that are projecting here and 
you know, to you can kind of visualize it because it's what we did at the back. And so when we look at this and we push the, the balconies back, it, it has a far greater feeling of this being flat. Now it's a slightly different context because we've still got the parking that's covered and hidden underneath. Um, but as you look at this top portion of the building uh, and then you go and you can see what happens when it's flat. And then you look at this piece when they're brought forward. And in terms of framing the street, again, pedestrian oriented, street friendly design that's usually happening in around a meter, meter and a half is, is meant to really frame that street. And whether it's a meter in or a meter out, I think it's more important to say that an, the activated front is the one that we're submitted and therefore been look, looking for the variance because it, 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 is, it is obviously uh, something that would be required for this approval. But by just pushing it back, we think that it is it it downgrades the amount of articulation on the front, and that's that's the main driver as to why we've submitted it in this fashion. And and um, uh, but as it relates to the effect on the on the street, um, we think this is a better solution. And and again, fairly minor as it relates to uh, uh, to that pedestrian realm happening in board of the property line. Thank you. That was that was helpful. Uh, that those are all my questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Birch. <clears throat> Ms. Coos, any questions? Oh, you're on mute. No, still on mute. I uh, I was looking for the mute button, but I couldn't find it while uh, um, the screen was being shared. Apologies for the delay. A couple of questions. Um, first of all, and I don't know if you're the right person to ask and just let me know if you're not. There was some discussion and there were materials in the package um, about marketing of the units for sale as um, owner occupied residential units as opposed to visitor accommodation units. Can you speak to whether or not the use has changed since June, July or August, or the intended use? Through the chair, uh, I can I can I can add I guess a couple things. At one point, there was some consideration for some tourist home homes and visitor com. Um, those are different uses. One's residential, one's commercial. At the end of the day, the approved application that we have here is. Uh, commercial visitor accommodation throughout. Um, I guess maybe I'd also kind of add from this is a bit from my perspective, but as it, as it relates to, well, it feels like a townhouse, but it's behaving like a hotel. I, I think it's a very justified approach from a use condition that, um, again, not not to dwell too much on COVID. We've all heard we've all heard uh, as much as uh, as Phil as we can, but. This type of, this is not brand new to Canmore, it's not brand new across the province, but these sorts of units that are set up so that there's kind of zero contact and you get a door code and you can go and you check in and you don't have to have any uh, physical connection there as, as you enter a visitor accommodation, call it a hotel if you wish. Um, but what was also happening, especially prevalent in the town of Canmore was residential units that were becoming Airbnbs and, and then properties that were not zoned for commercial were becoming this hotel type visitor or calm and delineating the two has, has become a big push from the town. This zoning uh, that is in place here is 100% compliant with what's being put forward. But it's not not it's it's not traditional. But I, I would really kind of like emphasize the fact that it's the appropriate response to counteract some of those zoning violations that were happening. It's it's appropriate to where we are in the world with what's happening, and it's also very appropriate in terms of you know having uh, you know more than one owner come in here that can use the unit they're not living out there full time but they're able to kind of operate it a bit like a airbnb to have a place to come to to still bring some income in that aligns with the, the zoning 
Uh, and so I think that that is, that is somewhat a, a new uh, to many people who haven't seen it before. We've been seeing it a lot. And uh, like I said, it's, it's not brand new to Canmore, but um, uh, it, may be, it may be new to some people who haven't seen it before. So are you expecting that there'll be restrictions on title um, when these units are sold? Uh, through the chair, clarification on what type of restrictions you may be looking at? Restriction on um, limits of owner use and occupation as opposed to um, actual visitor use. Sure. Through the chair, I, I, I would anticipate that kind of just like uh, any, any zoning, any in, infractions uh, as it relates to how the property is being used does become a bit of a bylaw piece. I would not be surprised with uh, Condo Corp if there was another layer of, uh, of supervision there because again, these, these owners will all be kind of banded towards the same cause and, and complaints or infractions kind of, like, kind of sheds, sheds a poor light on them all. So I do think there would be an intermediate level there, a bit of a, again, operations piece. So I don't want to... Um, speak like I know that for a matter of fact, but I, again, similar developments, similar projects, that's something that I would anticipate. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and one other question for you. Um, are there restrictions on the size of vehicles that can use the parkade? Um, and as an example, just to clarify the question, in the Spring Creek area, there are several buildings where large trucks and large SUVs can access the parkades and therefore forced to use street parking. So I'm just wondering your particular design parkade, it's hard to tell from the drawings, if there are length or height restrictions that will restrict the uh, visitor's ability to actually park in the designated stalls. Through the chair. Uh... The height, length, width, all kind of per the uh, town's bylaw. Um, I would anticipate, you know, somebody comes in with a one-ton, one-ton dually truck. There's, they're not going to fit there. They're not going to fit in a, a typical stall uh, in the town of Canmore, and that, and that sort of uh, vehicle, you know, would 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 not be capable of of parking in there, and there would be. Um, the kind of typical restrictions listed uh, as part of as part of the rental agreement. Um, so I guess in, in short, the answer is yes. In, in in very short, they meet the towns the towns bylaw requirements as it relates to those dimensions. No further questions. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Coos. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Russell, I, I, I gather, I mean, you're the architect in the in the in this particular application, are you not? You're, you're not. You're not. Some of your some of your answers implied that you really don't know how the building will operate uh, and how it will be used, or and how it will be how parking would be enforced or whatever. So you're not really. I guess I sense there's some flexibility being sought there, or you just don't know the answers to them. Is that is that fair? For the chair, I am the architect. Um, again, my knowledge is based purely on uh, the project as it relates to the development permit, to the building permit. Some of the questions are going into more detail on how the how the building will be run, which are not applicable to strictly planning rationale. And so, I do not want to imply that I uh, have the answers beyond that operation standpoint. Uh, except other than as I as I've seen other ones. Uh, which are probably fairly valid to answer those questions, but I can't say, state that as a matter of fact because um, you know whether it's true today, it could some of those operation pieces could could change in five years. So I think it's important to delineate that that difference between kind of the the approach as it relates to the bylaw and um, and future considerations that um, that may change over time and in, in how the buildings operate. Thank you. And, and in terms of in terms of the building and its use, you, you heard the residents' concerns are more focused around the potential operation of the facility and traffic that might be using it. What's, what's your experience on prior projects where, where a building like this has been constructed 
and uh, has the number of bedrooms versus the number of parking stalls provided? I mean, are, are the, are the uh, estimates provided by the, the appellate, are they, are they wildly out of uh, expectation or, I mean, is it one vehicle per unit or if you have three bedrooms, do you have the potential to have your, your grandfather and your mother and father and your, your children driving vehicles there? I mean, what's your experience? Sure, through, through the chair, I'm happy, happy to answer this question. I, I do think they're just by nature of uh, kind of my beliefs and my position, there is a little bit of subjective nature there. So uh, I'll, I'll, let, me, let me kind of say this. I, there, I've heard some higher numbers. I, there's, there's, 20, there's 23 beds, I think, in certain cases. Um, some of the counts I've heard 27 beds. I think they're counting the, the loft floor twice. Um, getting getting some pretty some pretty big numbers in terms of resident counts. I know that for myself, uh, with uh, two young kids, one one boy, one girl, for example, the most common unit that I'm looking to to rent when I come to Canmore, and I, I love coming to Canmore, is is more of the three bedroom variety. That's that's a bedroom for my wife and I. My two kids don't want to share a bedroom at this point because they've they've passed that age. And I mean, that's a prime example where you have one vehicle uh, for one three bedroom unit. And in what's been discussed, we're talking, the, 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 the discussion is multiplying that, I think uh, somewhat unjustly, but more so from a planning perspective. Uh, you know, if, if you had more parking stalls uh, that were provided, you, you would have more traffic because you would be enabling uh, more vehicles to come to the site. So I think by saying the minimum's one and the maximum's one, what you're going to get is one vehicle coming to that unit. And I've done multiple projects in Canmore with this requirement, and, and that's what happens. And the people who are renting it will either accept that or they'll look for an accommodation. If they have more than one party coming, they will look elsewhere. And as there was some discussion to... What's happening there now, you have a three bedroom house essentially, and you have uh, the area to park multiple cars and you're gonna get multiple cars coming in there. But if that area wasn't provided, those stalls weren't available, those vehicles would not have a place to go. And consequently, that group that's renting it would need to go somewhere else that would suit their needs. The, the approach to um, parking and vehicle use uh, from a from a local perspective and from a national perspective is trying to reduce the reliance on the vehicle. There are multiple modes to get out there to Canmore through the shuttle, through buses, through a few other ways. And that is likely to uh, become more over time as vehicle ownership uh, begins to decline, as that cost continues to go up. And so I think what's proposed here is a very fitting uh, response to say, we know people have cars, you have one spot to park. And, and if that's not enough for you, then you're going to be, you're going to be looking to go somewhere else because, or, or uh, figure out how to, how to carpool in a different place to put your car, because there's, there's simply no room there. And um, I, th I think it's a valid approach and that's, that's a long winded answer to your question. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Russell. Uh, those are all the questions of the board. So I thank you for your, your remarks uh, and you can step down now. Are, is there anyone else that you're aware of, Mr. Russell, that will speak to in favor, in, in opposition to the appeal? Uh, uh, through the chair, uh, not, to, not to my knowledge. I know I've, I've kind of fielded a few things with, with my group, obviously. I could have, we could have got kind of multiple people from the same, same side here, but um, I was I was the lucky candidate to to speak here today, and again, I do truly uh, appreciate everyone's time. And I also I'm aware of the project that's down the that's down the block. And I again back to the the community. You know, it, it's you know as I heard unjustly or justly, this will set a precedent. I do think that's a totally different uh, parcel. There is the ability to access. Uh, not off of Mallard on that. So I do think that as it relates to the vehicle side of things, um, you might end up with something completely different there. And it's tough to speak to it when uh, um, 
when nothing when nothing's on the table and and every application needs to kind of stand on its own and, and in my opinion as it relates to the current uh bylaws that are in place and deviating from that uh is 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 something that you know from a approvals point of view uh can't really be done because that actually sets a more dangerous precedent than anything else okay well thank you very much for your your thoughts and uh with that then i think we then move to any other speakers who may neither favor nor oppose the appeal is there anyone in that category Hearing none, then um, in terms of concluding the hearing, does administration, uh, Ms. Miller, do you have any closing remarks, comments, or clarifications? Yes, I do. Please proceed. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there are a couple items that were raised by some of the speakers that administration wanted to take a moment to respond to. Uh, before I get into some of the planning related matters, I just want to look to my colleagues in engineering to see if there's any additional comments they'd like to provide with regard to parking. Um, yeah, I would like to speak. Um, Please go ahead. Thank you. So yeah, I just want to acknowledge that we've heard um, some traffic concerns about this development and um, provide a little bit of context around the classification for Mallard Alley, uh, which is a local roadway um, that our department expects the traffic generated by this development to fit within the town's engineering guideline for this classification of road. Um, that said, I do also want to acknowledge the context of Mallard Alley that it's a shared space between people and vehicles. It has a six meter wide right of way. Um, and just share that the town has processes to review operational concerns from residents. It's quite common for us to receive these sorts of requests from the community and to review opportunities for traffic calming and so on that suit the space uh, and for that to be addressed based on priority and funding through our capital programs. So I'll just note that these requests have also been shared with us uh, as a separate request from a member of the community. And that input's been heard and it's being reviewed by our department right now separately from this development um, and which is providing access and parking that's consistent with the town's uh, guidelines and requirements. I think at this point, I don't have anything that has not been discussed in terms of parking. So I'll pass it back over to planning. Thanks, Claire. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, oh, just, oh, if oh. I may, Mr. Chairman, would, and, and this could be to Lord Miller, how would you like us to approach the questions that we may have individually or at the end? Um, maybe at the end, I'd like to make our concluding comments and because those comments may address some of your questions and then we could address questions at that point if that's okay with the board. That, that was my intention, Mr. Burke, was to wait until admin had filled it, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Thank Miller. Thank you. So three, Mr. Chair, a um, couple of items that we just would like to speak to um, the applicant has mentioned it uh, somewhat, and so just want to reiterate some elements. Uh, with regard to a change of use, uh, I was alluded to in one of the submissions and one of the speakers mentioned uh, that there might be a change of use application that has been submitted. Um, I can uh, assure the board that there has been no application for change of use submitted at this point in time. Um, administration can only move forward with what the applicant has proposed, and that is uh, a visitor accommodation. Uh, we can't assume ill intent of the applicant, uh, nor try to predict if or how the building could be used in the future. Uh, if a matter of non-compliance were to be identified in the future, we would be in a position to address it at that time. Uh, I'd like to speak to some of the comments that were made about the ownership. Uh, we cannot regulate the ownership model that the applicant chooses to use for their development. The town's primary concern is how the building is being used. Whether the use itself is owned by a single owner, multiple owners, <coughs> conglomerate of owners, uh, this would not prevent the building from being used as its approved use, which is a visitor accommodation. Uh, there were also comments made about users. Uh, and we'd just like to make clear that um, as planners and land use regulators, we don't regulate users, we regulate use. Therefore, as part of our review of proposals, uh, we do our best to uh, limit speculation about the type of clientele associated 
with a particular use and the behavior they may or may not demonstrate as it has been noted to be discriminatory. Uh, so just wanted to note that, that we are strictly focused on the use of the building, not the users. There was also mention about priors, prioritization of needs. Um, our goal in our reviews is to balance the rights of the property owner and their right to develop their land, along with the concerns and needs of the public. We do our utmost <laughs> to work with applicants to find a reasonable balance of the needs of all stakeholders. Um, the review of the application on this matter was not a prioritization of the applicant's needs over that of the public, but it was to a certain extent, an acknowledgement that there is legal limitations to what the town can and cannot require of a developer. Uh, we may not always agree with what the regulations are in place at that time, but we're not in a position to, as one speaker mentioned, bait and switch to change those regulations on the fly once an application is submitted. Uh, with regard to parking, one speaker mentioned that it might not be, um, it might be more reasonable to calculate parking based on the number of bedrooms. Uh, we do, as uh, Ms. Alec mentioned, we do hear the concerns about the parking ratios. And while there might be ideas of different ways that we could apply uh, or determine the parking required for a use, the fact remains is the one stall per accommodation unit is the regulation that is in place at the time and is the most that we can require. Uh, we do apply different ratios to different uses, um, but that is not the ratio that's been used for this use at this time. Another speaker mentioned 4.1.4 uh, within the land use bylaw, which speaks to the use specific regulations. Now, there are no use specific regulations within that section of the land use bylaw that are specific to visitor accommodation. Therefore, requirements of the placement of uses within uh, on specific floors or within a building that is visitor or calm is not applicable. So there's no limitation to ground floor uses for visitor calm buildings to only have retail, office, or commercial. Such requirements are applicable for other specific uses that are both permitted and discretionary within the TC district um, and are outlined within 4.1.4. The figure does note different uses on different floors, but this is strictly for illustrative purposes, not directive ones. Uh, there were some comments made about future reviews or council direction on this particular matter. I did wanna clarify that the council uh, direction that was referenced that was made at the September 7th regular meeting of council uh, was in response to a motion that was made some time ago where council directed administration to undertake a public consultation process to deal with the short term tourist home rentals of detached dwellings, not visitor accommodation as a whole. The direction council gave at that September 7th meeting was that since this matter had not been, been, been brought back to this council during their term, they rescinded their original motion and directed administration to work with the next council on this issue. However, it is not clear what the priorities of the next council will be. So at this time, there isn't a review of visitor accommodation on the books in the near future. As well, this ties into some comments that were made about CPC. Uh, the CPC did discuss the parking ratios for visitor accommodation at length during their meeting. Um, and they did discuss a desire to submit a letter to council to recommend the initiation of a review on the parking requirements for visitor accommodation. However, such a letter has not been submitted. Um, and as such, and again, not knowing what the priorities of the new council will be, if a letter is submitted, there's no guarantee that the new council will feel that this will be a priority that they need to direct administration to undertake that work. So I just wanted to clarify those few points. And if you have any further questions for administration, uh, we're happy to respond to them. Okay, Ms. thank you for that, Ms. Miller. Mr. Burst, do you have any follow-up questions? I do. Um, given the uh, policies and restrictions of the town of Kenmore, is it possible to have the street access 
sorry, having the parking access from the front of this building? In other words, would the town approve access for the parking area off of 10th Street? So I will start off by answering that question. And then if my colleagues in engineering would have any additional questions, I would open the floor to them. Uh, so the regulations as currently within the land use bylaws is, uh, is a preference for uh, the access to come off of the lane. So um, in short, the answer would be no, um, but if the applicant was uh, determined to move forward with uh, access off the front, they would have the right to bring forward an application with that, with that element, but no guarantee of whether it would be approved or not. I see Ms. Ellick has turned her, her camera on, so she may have some additional comments. Yeah, Ms. and I'll, oh, sorry, may I speak? Yes, please. Um, and I'll just add to that in terms of the engineering design and construction guidelines and the classification of 10th Street, which is a collector roadway. So uh, that would, uh, would recommend that access be taken from the rear. Uh, also, we're considering the pedestrian oriented nature of uh, 10th Street and future plans that we have along there. We would want to limit vehicular access points um, in that space. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question. The, the um, land use bylaw section 4152 talks about streetscape and, uh, you know, friendly walking areas and stuff like that. And I'm just, and, and then some of the appellants noted uh, something you've already addressed, Ms. Miller, about uh, having retail or commercial, I shouldn't say commercial because accommodation, visitor accommodation is commercial, but um, would, would have some retail, restaurants, service type industries on the lower level. Um, and just for clarity there, is there anything in the municipal development plan or the land use bylaw that you are aware of that would kind of lean uh, lean applicants towards having that kind of um, more well more retail service type commercial space on the main level. Is there is is there anything that would suggest to you that that would be a more appropriate use on the main level? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, with the regulations that are currently in the land use bylaw, uh, I think it, it's, it's clear that we do believe that there are some uses where we feel that uh, certain uses are more appropriate at the ground level in order to support some of those design requirements that you uh, alluded to in 4.5 and making things more pedestrian oriented. Um, and then some for some uses um, that might not be appropriate. And since within the district, there's kind of an array of uses that could or could not be applied for. Um, we've, we've identified the key ones. And uh, so I think that kind of speaks to our, um, we've already codified the uses that we feel that it would be most appropriate for kind of that mix of use or specific use at the ground level. Um, so that obviously would have come from direction from other policy documents as well. Thank you. Sorry, that's the end of my questions, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. I, I muted myself a second too early. Thank you very much, Mr. Birch. Ms. Coombs, any, anything from your, your side? I have um, two questions. One, has there been a traffic impact assessment done for this development? Is that something that the developer would do or the town would do? And are you aware of one? Through you, Mr. Chair, I'll refer that to Ms. Alec. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the chair, no one has not been completed. We use the same criteria as the city of Calgary in terms of uh, the threshold for development that would warrant a traffic impact assessment, which is 100 person trips uh, in the peak hour. So this is well under that and it wasn't required as part of this development. Thank you, um, Ms. Alec. Um, and I think this question perhaps uh, directed to you as well. There was mention um, during the earlier presentations that Mallard Alley is one-way traffic. It's a narrow road and two cars cannot pass at the same time. Um, I, I think you made some reference to six meters, but I, I can't uh, put that in context. Can you speak to um, the nature of that road, whether or not it can accommodate two-way traffic? Um, uh, yes, uh, through the chair. So it is a six meter right of way uh, width. So that does accommodate, it is tight for two vehicles to pass. So. 
low speeds are appropriate. Um, as I think a few of our presenters have mentioned, there's not separated sidewalk in that space. So um, in reviewing some of the operational concerns that have been shared by um, some of the people in this meeting, um, looking for opportunities to traffic calm to make that a more comfortable space is the approach that we would take there versus other local roadways within the community that have wider rights of way. But um, six meters is the same width as we have for uh, alleys throughout the community and that's a requirement for emergency services and it's also the same width that we build a carriageway on a local roadway too. Thank you. Relating to that question, is there parallel parking on uh, Mallard Avenue or only driveway parking for the current residents? There is no parking permitted within that right of way. Uh, the full width is required uh, for emergency access. So on street parking supply would be off the side streets. And by off the side streets, you mean some other road, not Mallard Avenue? Uh, it would be sixth and seventh or yeah, within the surrounding area, but not on Mallard Alley. Okay, thank you. No further questions, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I have no further questions. Ms. Miller, um, I think I, does that complete your your input at this at this stage? <laughs> yes, it does. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then we move to Mr. Schultz. Mr. Schultz, is that Pellant? Do you have any closing remarks, clarifications, or comments? Uh, thank you, Chairman Locke. Um, just a couple of things to, to clarify. One of them that was just touched on was that there uh, is no parking available on Mallard Alley uh, outside of our, our private property driveways, um, all used all too frequently by unknown individuals because they can't find parking anywhere else. So they park on our, they park in my driveway and then leave. And it happens all too, uh, all too frequently. A uh, question was asked about whether, what kind of development would we support unequivocally? And we, I would refer back to 4.1.8, uh, the illustration for showing retail on main level office commercial on second and residential on the third floor. That mirrors uh, exactly the last development that was uh, built here in Mallard Alley about, I wanna say five or six years ago. The, um, you, sir, had asked one of our neighbors if we, I think Mr. Sugarman, uh, but would we participate in uh, the town's review of the land use bylaws? We've been, we've been doing that for 40 years. Uh, we've taken interest in our neighborhood since the, since the beginning. And the essence of what we have in the land, land use bylaw today, which originally emanated from CB bracket SDA, which only applied to this block of, of 10th Street, there's certain elements of that that still continue today in the last land use bylaw, for which we're, it has minimized the impact of the, uh, the commercial development on our residences. The, um, uh, one of the questions that I've got, and I'm just gonna leave it with you, it's why so many unresolved issues with regards to what this building is going to look like that have been raised here that are unresolved, but we're going to get a approval. To me, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it seems to be a rather odd way about going about planning that, well, let's just approve it, but we have all these issues to be addressed and subsequently resolved. Um, I wanna make comment to the proponents, um, comment about people coming to, um, a, he, he cited as his family as an example himself, his wife and two children uh, prefer three bedroom units. So they don't, the kids don't have to share, they come in one car. That's one example. And that he went on to say, look, people, you know, if they, they can't find, a, if they can't find uh, appropriate parking and accommodation that they're looking for, they're going to choose other accommodation uh, you're going to make other accommodation choices. In a word, that's nonsense. That's utter nonsense. We don't we don't make our accommodation choices based on available parking. And we have more than enough anecdotal evidence here with the existing structure about multiple cars being used in this in this property. Twenty three or twenty seven uh, bedrooms is rather moot. Let's go with what the proponent has said is twenty three. 
we're not going to see on any given night only 10 cars show up. It's a ridiculous idea that that's going to be the case. The uh, lastly, um, and I and I appreciate the town. Well, it's going to be second to last now. I uh, wanted to point out that the empty lot, which we're so concerned about what will be developed in the future, and I understand um, the town's reticence to get ahead of that because they don't, they, they can't, they can't uh, deal with anything a, a development in a vacuum. We did have and were made aware of a, of a proposal for that particular piece of property that had 45 plus units being proposed for it. And as identified by Ms. Miller, only access off the alley as far as parking is concerned. There is no option for this to be moved on to 10th Street. I don't believe the town now nor in the future will support that, even if it does make sense for the Mallard Alley neighborhood. That particular proposal fell through the floor because the current owner, which is an American, wanted to subsequently enter into a, a lease agreement with a developer and not sell the property that fell through. We know that's going to be developed in the future and we're gonna find almost exactly the same kind of development as being, as being proposed and we're hearing about today being brought forward for that development. Um, oh, I forgot my last point. I, it is, Within the town center, within TCD, visitor accommodation may be, um, and this kind of project may be envisioned. It's not clarified because we don't, it, it's not delineated. The example 4.1.8 is just an example, but it is probably a more, well, it's not probably, we know that this kind of development would have a more effective standing elsewhere in the town center district not immediately abutting a low density residential district such as Mallard Alley. It, it's really kind of, it's, there's where, there's where the, the issue stands for us. The, the, and I'll just say my last comment, which has popped into my head, if you'll forgive me, Mr. Chair, is the town, the planning department has done everything it can to ensure that the concerns of the developer are brought front and center and addressed with very little being brought to the concerns and risks that we are going to have for our future use, enjoyment and value on our property. And that's just, it's unfair. It's classically unfair. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your patience with me as well, sir, and the other members of the board. Uh, this is very important to us. We're very passionate about this. Um, get the developer to bring something back across that looks quite a bit different and we'll sign up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Mr. Birch, any questions of Mr. Schultz? No, I, I do not. Thank you. Ms. Coos? No further questions. would like to thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. That, that is all the board's questions. And um, I, I thank you and your colleagues uh, for participating today. The information exchange, I think, has been very interesting and valuable. Um, in, in, last, in, in last comment to you, Mr. Schultz, um, do, do you as the applicant feel you've had a, a fair opportunity to put your, your points forward to the board for their consideration and have had a fair hearing? Yes, sir, I do. I, I think that we've been, all of us have been given a, a very uh, open opportunity to express our concerns and we appreciate you receiving them. Okay, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> Then this hearing then now is concluded and in accordance with provincial legislation, as I mentioned earlier on, we are required to hand down a decision within the next 15 days from today's date. And no decision is binding until the board issues that written decision. So I will then move the board adjourn uh, the hearing of September the 16th, uh, and I would ask for those in favor to raise their hands. Okay, now at this stage, um, we are going to go ahead with the, the business meeting, uh, which doesn't require uh, the attendance of any of the parties. So the parties are free to go at this stage. So should the board, but at this point, uh, I guess, 
I, I'm going to go in camera at this point. Am I not, Mr. Birch? I think we would normally um, do the public, sorry, in public look after the business meeting, yeah, just yeah. in case anybody okay. wants to be around. So we've then ended the, we've adjourned the, the hearing dealing with the appeal and we will now, move, I move the board return to the public hearing to deal with the business meeting. Thank you. Okay, uh, I call this business meeting of the subdivision appeal board to order. It says, I said, just typically the board members, the clerk and members of administration present. But if there are members of the public present, you may certainly choose to introduce yourself and, and stay online but it's not necessary. My name is Graham Locke. I will be chair for this hearing. All members and comments shall be directed through the chair and the board members are Mr. Birch, Mr. Greg Birch and Ms. Michelle Coon, Coos. <laughs> I had to look at your name in the picture. <laughs> Short memory. Um, so uh, me, me um, to the clerk and the board, are there any additions, deletions, and changes to the agenda as provided for the business meeting? Jolene? Nope, none from me. Okay. And I move the board to adopt the agenda as circulated or as amended. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. And are there any additions, deletions, or changes to the minutes which we are approving for the appeal hearing? I don't have any, uh, and I'd be willing to move if you if you want uh, the December fifteenth, twenty twenty, appeal hearing meeting minutes. Yeah, thank thank you for clarifying that. I didn't want it to be confused with the current hearing. <laughs> Very good, thank you. So we are approving the minutes of of that particular prior appeal hearing. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And, and Mr. Locke, I would move the um, minutes of the business meeting of December 15th as well. Very good. And all those in favor? Yep. That's approved, carried unanimously. Um, do we, we don't have a confirmed scheduled business meeting uh, next, do, do we, Mr. Julie? No, we do not. Okay. So there's no, other, there's no other business that I'm aware of? I, not a next scheduled business meeting. Okay. Is it would be tagged with an appeal. Okay. There's no other business at this time. Um, on the agenda, I did put the refund that was asked for the application oh, fee. Right, you are. And uh, yeah. Okay. So how how should we deal with that? Would you like to speak to that, or would you like me to to, to speak to it? Um, well, I can say, and Miss Miller can speak up if she if I'm missing anything. But so at the time mm -hmm. of the notice of appeal, the subdivision and development appeal board bylaw didn't have anything in there saying that you, sorry, let me rephrase that. We had in effect a subdiv an SDAB refund bylaw that said that a appellant could request a refund and then it would be up to the board. But now currently we have amended that bylaw and uh, we now say that the board cannot consider appeal refunds. And the only way that a fee can be refunded is if they um, withdraw their appeal before anything is booked. So it, you're bound to go by the bylaw in effect and the bylaw in effect right now uh, does not allow you to consider a refund. Uh, I did want to put it on the agenda to acknowledge it since uh, the appellant did ask for it and it was a valid ask at the time. Right. Okay. Um. Is there is there a motion required to uh, let the let the appellate know that we are denying it as per the bylaw? Yeah, I think you could just say that, that you would make a motion to um, deny the request for refund of application fee. Okay, I'd, I'd make the motion more or less as you just said, uh, Jolene, but with the addition because of the uh, because of the wording of the bylaw. That's so so in short, something like. Uh, the board denies the um, request of the appellant to refund the application fee because the current bylaw does not allow such refunds. Something like that. I think that's fair. That's, yeah, that's a good way to put it. All in favor? Okay, then 
then uh, do we need another motion to adjourn? Yes, please. Okay. Move, also move. Second. Okay, so we're, <laughs> thank you, that's unanimous. Um, then, then we should actually chat about next steps, right? Do we yeah, do um, we'll just get Katie to cancel the live stream on YouTube and then we can yep. uh, carry on.